Montet. Goose. Here. Miranda. Here. And Citro. Here. We have a physical quorum. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be taking agenda item 106 first. Ms. Good Mass. afternoon, uh, City Council. Morris Massey, Deputy City Attorney. Real quickly before staff makes its presentation, this is just a report back to Council on some of the questions and motions that Council made at the first budget public hearing. Because the budget is subject to a very strict public hearing requirements under state law, this body should be taking no action on the budget itself today. at all today. You can give your feedback. But there shouldn't be any motions made, yes, any, sir. this, the, the only, only motion I would ask you all to make, and let me explain this real quickly. Right now, um, when you originally scheduled the second uh, public hearing for the, uh, on the budget on the millage rate, you scheduled it for 5.01 p.m. We've also scheduled the CRA budget hearing at 5.01 p.m. In consultation with the Florida Department of Revenue, they suggested that we have two distinct times for those hearings. And so we have advertised the city budget hearing for 6 o'clock p.m. That's what's on the website now. That's what's being advertised in the newspaper. So I, the only motion, I, if you would be willing to make, is a motion to conform that your, the, the public hearing, you, the original motion you made to set the public hearing, the second public hearing at 5.01 p.m., to set it now at 6 p.m., consistent with the advertisements that have been made by the city in connection with that. Other than that, there should be no action taken in conjunction with the budget today. I just want to... Sir? <laughs> yes, if you I make a motion uh, for, for legal for the two distinct from the CRA and the city budget. Second. Okay. A motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Goose? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek, Carlson, and Citro? Yes. Motion carry unanimously with Hertek and Carlson being absent. And just for the record, for clarity, that would be the CRA at 501, 501 p.m. And for the City Council budget at 6 o'clock. Is yes, that sir. correct, sir? Correct, sir. Thank Absolute, you. Absolutely. Then I will let Mr. Uh, Rahiro give you the press staff presentation. Thank you. Mr. Rahiro, before you start, let the record reflect that Councilman Carlson won't be joining us this afternoon. Mr. Rahiro. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council. Dennis Rojero, Chief Financial Officer. Of course, uh, at the September 6th first public hearing, Council had a number of questions. We have those answers for you today. We're also prepared to uh, discuss our ongoing efforts with departments to identify additional funding, again, as Council requested. Uh, if I may begin answering the questions that you asked. If I could have the Elmo up, please. Council will recall they asked, you asked, for a longer history of our ending available unassigned fund balance than we had provided. You see here we've taken it all the way back to 2004 and uh, quite a bit of variation associated with primarily two things. Uh, the, uh, the Great Recession, of course, right before which we had reached a high of 37 percent in our unassigned fund balance. And it's a good thing we did. A number of, uh, of factors adversely impacted us at, uh, during and following the Great Recession. You see uh, in 2010, 37%, about $140 million. We had Amendment 1 pass uh, at the uh, legislative level, severely impacting our revenues, compelling us to lower our millage rate. We had valuation decreases associated with the Great Recession for a number of years. And you can see here, we didn't plane out, if you will, to our, what, we, what is now our typical level till about 2014 or 24%. That is the level that we remain comfortable at, 23, 24, you see 24, 24, 23, et cetera. In 2020 and 2021, again, you can see a spike in our percentages, 28% and 27%. That's a result of the influx of all the federal funding that accompanied the COVID pandemic. Much of it found its way into the general fund. The American Rescue Plan Act was a very big portion of it. So by design, our fund balance increased and we allocated and continue to allocate that funding, bringing down the balance to the 24 and 23% on the far right you see here. So to give you an idea of the ebbs and flows, of course, at the very beginning, we were well, well under not only 
our typical percentage now, but indeed our policy of 20%. Are there any questions I can answer about our fund balance history? Seeing none. Thank you. Next, council had also asked about our outstanding debt by fiscal year. Again, you'd asked for a longer history than we provided at, excuse me, at the uh, September 6th public hearing. Here we've taken it all the way back to 2000. A couple of things to note. You can see that the general government in blue stayed pretty steady for almost the entirety of this, of this history you see here. It began to go up in fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, especially in fiscal year 22, the Hannah Avenue project, stormwater bonds. Again, we'll be coming to you later with some more stormwater bond actions. And the Enterprise Fund, a uh, little bit of ups and downs, but you can see the significant spike in the last couple of years associated, well, overwhelmingly with the PIPES program, almost $800 million worth of enterprise debt associated with that program. And again, more to come, hundreds and hundreds of million dollars more. Can I answer any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Council had also asked about our history of negotiated pay increases and our inflation rate. And you see that here for about a 20-year span from 2002 to 2021. As you've heard us say, as you've heard the Chief of Staff say, overall we have a very good history of meeting our local inflation and our negotiated increases with the unions. And when I say our local inflation, you can see here this is the Tampa Metropolitan Statistical Area. This is not the national inflation. Uh, for example, right now, the local inflation is percentage points higher than the national inflation. I think it's over 11% in this MSA versus a little over 8% nationally. So bringing it home, here's the history of how we've gone hand in hand each year with negotiated pay raises. The upshot is towards the end there, you can see over that 20 year period, we've been only about a percentage and a half off of what the cumulative local inflation was compared to the pay raises that we've negotiated with the unions. Of course, fiscal year 22, uh, the rule book was thrown out, and it looks like the rule book will stay thrown out for fiscal year 23. And again, we, as part of the recommended budget and subsequent to, an our, to our negotiations with the collective bargaining agencies, we have the 9.5% for the union members, and then the various percentage for those other categories that we've discussed. So a very good history, and we're trying to continue that history with these uh, extraordinary negotiated percentages we're dealing with right now. Can I answer any questions from council about this? Please continue. Thank you. Those are the questions that we took from the September 6th meeting. Again, council had asked that the responses, when we can, be put into a visual format. Again, it's a, a much user-friendly, I think, for the layperson, and of course, it helps us too. If I can now, I'll speak to our ongoing efforts with the departments in trying to find additional funding as council requested. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. I'll begin by reiterating, you've heard us say it before and we'll, and we'll say it again, this is a very, very tight recommended budget. The tolerances uh, have very little room for flexibility without reprioritizing what's contained within the recommended budget. It's a tight budget. A great example, and we're working it, is the five and a half million dollars of solid waste revenue replacement associated with the American Rescue Plan Act. We've heard Council's reprioritization of that funding, and we're accounting for it in the housing category. As we continue to look with the departments, we're really attacking it from three, maybe even four different levels. 
The first level, of course, especially when it comes to the general fund, are pay increases and staffing increases. That is the overwhelming majority of what we can work with in the general fund. And again, with nine and a half negotiated increases for the collective bargaining agencies and the many, many additional positions associated with either maintaining services or in some instances expanding services, that's where any funding for any other purpose would have to come. We don't imagine there's going to be a lot of headway in that review, but we're reviewing it. On a related note, the second level would be operating expense increases. Again, these are associated with services and uh, touch the public safety agencies, transportation, uh, construction services, facilities maintenance. As we go through those increases for fiscal year 23, we have to ask ourselves, what will be the impact on services? Some of these were, again, to maintain existing services in the face of increasing demands. Some of them are to uh, expand existing services because we've heard the council, we've heard the public. So as we look through there, an excellent example of that are vehicle replacements. You recall in total we put $30 million in the current fiscal year towards vehicle replacements. We have in the recommended budget another additional $30 million. As we've discussed, we rely heavily on the communication, uh, I'm sorry, on the community investment tax, the CIT, for vehicle replacements. We're still behind on vehicle replacements from the Great Recession, and of course the CIT is going away. Uh, from a budget perspective, a planning and forecast perspective, it'll be gone before you know it. So these are some of the difficult discussions we're having before we bring you options for additional funding on the uh, 20th. And finally, the capital improvement program. Uh, as we've discussed and we continue to review it internally and discuss with the departments, there are a number of different facets we need to look at for those projects. <coughs> First and foremost, can the revenue for those projects be used for housing? Okay, uh, a, a significant proportion cannot, as we've discussed. Secondly, are there balances in those projects that are funded from revenues that we can apply to housing? Of course, if there's no balance, well, that, that can't be considered. That horse has left the barn. If there is a balance, then we need to decide, well, what impact will that taking that balance have on the project? Will it cripple the project from a performance, from a goal perspective? Will it require the project to be spaced out over time, for instance? Or can it be done? And as we look at the project's uh, progress and where we think it will end up, does this really look like it's going to be bona fide surplus funding that we can use elsewhere? So again, we're attacking it from a number of different levels. We have the five and a half million dollars in solid waste uh, ARPA funding, and we continue to work what council has requested. And I can answer any questions you have now. We can also come back, of course, between now and the second public hearing. No questions. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know what? I, if you want, not, not for Mr. Rivera, may I just go to Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I wanted to, uh, Mr. Shelby, the discussion we had yesterday regarding um, the um, separate vote on modification of any salaries that it was your opinion. Uh, st strike that. 6.06 .06 for, for Tuesday. What was your opinion? That's all. If I understand correctly, your question was whether you can have a separate vote to have uh, the, the pay increases. Yes. And my understanding is that um, if a motion is made and a second is made, you could have a second vote. Uh, I could be a separate vote on, on, on the, on the uh, pay increase, just as you have. I'm sorry, sir. I may have some information that may be helpful on this question. Yes, sir. The budget itself, your, the salary of city council is the same as it was and as it historically has been in the budget. Um, the budget does allocate sufficient funds in the personnel funds that if later in the year you should determine that you think an increase to your salary is okay. appropriate, then at that point in time we would we could move forward with a resolution to adjust your salaries which would come to council for a full vote. Okay. But by approving the budget you are not approving 
and that's, increasing your salary. That's, that's if I may, if I may, sir. That, that's what I wanted to highlight. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Massey and Mr. Shelby, for your uh, uh, work in that regard. Thank you, gentlemen. May I? With that, I'm confused that, here. I'm a, what, 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 increase. I'm confused here. Why were you discussing that? As a, my colleague, Mr. Goose, I'm trying to digest that yeah, and swallow it at the same time. I, the question but, that... Let me, me finish. So yeah. What I'm hearing from what you said, yeah. sir, is that the budget salary stays the same until the council decides to change it. Correct. More than likely after the election. Correct. Correct. What a country. Mr. Massey, that's yeah. not, I, I, and maybe Mr. Rojero can answer that question. That's not true for all the salaries that are located in the budget, is that no. correct? Is that in the charter after the election? I mean, is that in the charter? The, the charter requires what, I, what, what, can, and, I, and then I'll let Mr. O'Hero talk about what's in the budget. Um, what the charter, there's this charter provision section 6.06 .06 that says that any adjustment in the salary of officials, which you are and the mayor are the elected officials of the city, would require a resolution or a vote by, it, it needs to be recommended by the mayor and then a majority vote by this body in order to effectuate those changes. I think the question that was raised is whether there was, given the discussion of a fairly large incre potential increase in the salary of city council members, whether that was baked into the budget. That amount is not, to my understanding, in the but there is money in the budget set aside that if at a later time it's determined that you do want to do that, it could be accomplished. But the the, the our charter requires that the salary of the Every, all employees and officers be listed in the budget. And you would, if you go to the budget book and you look at the salaries, mm -hmm. the salary amount for you all are, I think is the same, except maybe, maybe a 3% CPI. That may be in there. But so that, so when do you same. vote on that then? It is the same. No, you would, no, it's the same. It's the same. Oh, right. Okay. So, the, so, so you would vote on it when you all, if you all, if you want to vote on it, Thursday, we could, we, you know, I, I guess we, a resolution could be prepared. So it, yeah, we need to vote on Thursday. Well, I'll make a motion for we throw it on Thursday. Let's get it out, get it out of the way. I'll uh, that. Yeah, let's get it out of the way. Let's, let's do not you want it effective immediately? When would you like that? Yeah, let's put, if it's in the budget, then we need to go ahead. If it's in the budget, we need to go ahead and vote on it and get it out of the way and not play games with it and not right. make a political type situation. Let's get it out of the way. I, I, agree, with, right. I agree with that. And if uh, I'm not against raises, but I'm not for a 42% raise. If that's in the budget, 42 percent. If, if I can, yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you, sir. If I can clarify, the funding that is in the city council department for your pay increases is as it is now. Any increase, whether it's the 3 percent or an out of the ordinary increase that has been discussed, is being held in a special reserve should council decide to pursue. So then, in other words, you got a pot of money that equals to the sums of $72,000 times seven. Yes, sir. Difference. Yes, sir. Or 20, about 140 some thousand, whatever it is. Yes, sir. Am I exactly. correct? Yes. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll be voting against my own budget. Thank you very much. Understood. I'll be voting for the budget. I'll be voting for it. Oh, I'm sorry. Other questions? Absolutely. And relative to bringing forward a resolution relative to that, we could bring it forward potentially on the, the, that Thursday. I will tell you, typically, the way we handle changes to the budget, which this would be, um, is that if you all make a motion that you would like to have that change made to the budget, that's usually brought to this council the very first city council meeting after the budget's adopted. The reason being is that the budget that's published online, we have a very complicated budget. I mean, it, as you all know, it's a thousand pages plus. So when you start adjusting figures and line items, that's very difficult to do on the fly. So that we typically, we, we approve the budget as is, and then we bring forward at the very next meeting uh, any changes that you all would like to make to the budget. So, That's Mr. Massey, do we need to make that motion today or do we need to make it on the, yes, on the right, You could do it. You, you know, I, you probably would maybe want to save that for the budget discussion, it sounds like. Um, Mr. Mr. Shelby, can you give Mr. Massey, make sure we write the right verbiage, and I'll be happy to make the motion. We need to get that out the way and let's not play politics with it. Who, who don't want it, then they don't have to get it, but let's go ahead and let other councilmen be able to vote how they want to vote. I did not quite. Well, I'm, forgive me again. I, yeah. I didn't get my emails and my internet until Tuesday afternoon. But I'm curious as to how it would be phrased because is it something that requires well, the mayor's I, I, recommendation? I, 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 I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm hearing is that if you all, I mean, I think the decision would be, do you want to amend the budget so, it's, so there's no money in your fund available for any increase this, this 
calendar year. If not, then, then, then you would leave the budget that, that way, and then you could consider potentially, you don't have to, but you could potentially consider an increase later in the year. Let me ask you this. If it's not in the, if it's not in the budget now, how would it otherwise get into the budget? There, there are funds there's funds available in the city council budget for future salary adjustments, but the salary that's being approved is the, exactly the same salary as of as of approval of the budget, it's the, there's no change. Oh, there's in a the, separate line then yes. for that money? Yes. So it would not require a budget amendment. I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify from a wonkish perspective, yeah. it's, a tr it's sitting in a true reserve, so it would require a financial resolution to move would, the funding. It would require, I'm sorry? It would require a financial resolution to move the funding from a special reserve to a personnel, uh, to the personnel section. Well, we can get that done on Thursday. The budgeting, it all needs to be done and handled on Thursday, in my opinion. Uh, council members, Tuesday. Going, what, Tuesday. Tuesday, on Tuesday, and it needs to be done on one shot. That way the public can know, you know, the public can hear their concerns or not concerns. I mean, my thing is the budget committee has already told you we're understaffed the city council. You've already done your own study. It's not like, like, it's not like this council here told you what to go out and do anything. You were told by the budget committee, the administration did their due diligence by researching all of the cities and ensuring the factor is come back that it, we are uh, not where we need to be. And again, I, I don't I don't look at anybody's pocket. Anybody wants to do what they do with their money, it's fine. But for me, I think it needs to be dealt with. Councilman Miranda. Neither, neither do I. And I I'm sorry for the public got to listen to all this because yes. I know you got things on the calendar yes. you want us to do here. It's not against, I'm not against raises. But when you give somebody, four, what is it, 42% increase? There's something wrong with government. And I don't want to hear about the different cities because I, I know that St. Pete, Orlando, and Miami pay comparable to what we pay. Mm -hmm. I think one's at 58, one's at 60, one's at 52. I'm not sure. So that, that's all I'm going to say. But I just want to make sure that the public understands what we're doing. We're giving ourselves a raise of 42%, which nobody gets. None. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you clarify that we're not giving ourselves we're voting on that well what's the difference yeah. I'll vote <laughs> against it <laughs> chief just trying to simplify the process a little bit <clears throat> we did analysis as mr. O'Hara mr. Massey mm -hmm. said there is money in the personnel budget but not in your budget for an increase ideally on Tuesday if there is a separate vote I think there's four options to consider. That's why I want to give a little clarity. First of all, you could accept the recommendation of the analysis that we gave as one option. You could alter that as a second option, meaning instead of this percentage, it could be a different percentage. You could deny the increase completely, or you could delay the increase and still adjust the number. So the point is, is we did an analysis. We put it in there. It is not in your budget today. It's not in there today. If you approve the budget as is, as Chief O'Hara said, it would have to require an amendment to bring it in. It's simply a placeholder based on the analysis that we did that we thought was fair and equitable because you can't do your own. We had to do it for you in response to the economy. And so it can be decided to delay it, to thin it down, to deny it, or to accept it. And those are the four options that I see for council and if you just stick with the budget, it could just be yes or no, or a delay, if you don't want to throttle it down from the 42% to something more in line with what you think is going on today. That's fine. That was not a raise. That was a market analysis. I think there's a difference. So you have a market analysis, and you have an increase. The increase that has been budgeted for this level of the organization, the electeds, was 3%, which would take effect on May 1. So the only real increase was the 3%. The market analysis was done based on the feedback and the work that we did, and we just put that placeholder in the reserves. Again, it can be denied, it can be modified, it could be delayed completely, or it could be accepted. So those are the four options I see on Tuesday. Thank you. Shall we get on with city business? We have to. Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilwoman Hurt. <coughs> Vote on Tuesday. As I said, let's get on with city business. Agenda item number seven. Shall we open seven and eight together? 
Yes. yes, that would be. Uh, we will open agenda item seven and eight, which is T22-77194 and T22-77214. Uh, good afternoon, Deputy uh, Brad Bear, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. Um, I'm here to uh, request approval of an agreement that provides for a guaranteed maximum price for the Lower Hillsboro uh, Stormwater Improvements Project, uh, Southeast Region. Um, the uh, project amount is $55.3 million uh, to Kimmins Contracting Corporation. Uh, the project consists of construction of approximately 10,000 linear feet of box culvert, uh, pipes, laterals, inlets, and connections through and a regional pond. Um, and it includes passive, passive park amenities, including a trail and associated utility construction and also includes 3.8 million in water line replacement. Uh, the EPO, EBO subcontract goal um, as calculated by the city's goal committee is 8% for underutilized WMBE and SLBE combined. Um, that breakdown is 4% BBE and 4% SLBE. Um, however, uh, Kimmins has made a commitment to exceed that goal and very confident, uh, confident that they can. Um, I do have John Zamina here with, with uh, Kimmins, um, who is their vice president. And then virtually I have uh, Gregory Hart uh, here for support in case there's questions in, in either of those areas, uh, construction and EBO. Um, you all have been briefed individually by Vic B Day. Um, council, finally, Councilman Goods uh, has asked me to walk through how the goal was calculated, and I am prepared to do that at the pleasure of City Council, if you would like. Yeah, Councilman Goods, would you like that? Yes, sir. Mr. Beard, please do that, because, you know, again, that's the first thing I look at when you bring me these dollar numbers. Uh, and, again, I always say, let's, let us be the one that asks what we need. I know there's a standard you use but we should be the one asking what we want and then let those contracts who are applying be able to match what we really want. Uh, and hopefully in the future we're going to be able to do that. But if you would just explain how this particular contract got 8% because I know there were some, I guess, materials and things that some people just can't do that we just can't meet that. But I like the public to know that when you're talking about this big dollar amount of why we couldn't meet uh, a bigger high expectation. No, I am uh, very glad to, that uh, you asked us to do that because um, there is... Uh, uh, it's very detailed um, and a lot of work that our staffs go through, both uh, contract administration staff, the user department staff, and the EBO staff, um, to pull this all together and to set that goal. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple, um, but it starts with the user department, and in this case it would be uh, mobility or the, the stormwater section of mobility, um, would prepare what's called a project task worksheet and they will um, work with the engineer that's part of the uh, design build team um, to break down those tasks. And they'll break them down into um, tasks that the prime contractor performs and then uh, tasks that are subcontractable. And um, then at that point, uh, once that's you know, vetted by both uh, the engineering groups, uh, that is turned over to Gregory Hartz um, Equal Business Opportunity Office. And he, um, his uh, staff will go through and determine the availability of certified EBO firms in those categories, firms that are uh, ready, willing, and able to work. And he did that uh, line item by line item. Um, and he even breaks it down into availability of underutilized, availability of SLBEs, and then uh, availability of WMBEs that are non-underutilized. So he, he covers the whole a gambit. And um, I would like to read off um, those subcontracting uh, opportunities uh, that were used in this project. Um, there are several of them, but include public outreach, hauling, concrete sidewalks, driveways, brick paver driveways, concrete curb, survey, maintenance of traffic, asphalt paving, signing and paving striping, pipe supply, testing, landscaping, and sod. 
And then so they, they go through that, they calculate the goal, then they have um, several um, things at the end uh, that they can use for adjustments depending on the project. Um, and then I would like to say one final thing uh, to that end, and um, that is that the, um, this is large concrete culvert uh, that is necessary. And I said it was almost two miles worth, and um, that is a big part of this project. Those prices have gone up, by the way, associated with those large box culverts. And that is one item um, that uh, is not available to purchase through the black business enterprise that, that provide pipe supply. I will tell you, though, that um, Kimmins is confident they can exceed this goal um, for a couple of reasons. Some of the water work is open cut with ductile iron pipe, and that pipe uh, is being proposed to uh, through one of those firms. And then also, they were able to um, have recent discussions uh, with those firms to provide some of the uh, concrete structures, not the culverts, but the structures. And um, so that's why they're confident they can get double digits, um, you know, achieve double digits. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Councilwoman Hurtag. Uh, I appreciate um, the description uh, that I talked to Vic about uh, the presentation, and I appreciate it. And I know that the folks south of Gandhi are, are going to appreciate this project when it's done. But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the Southeast Seminole Heights project that's going on now and the trouble we've had with it. And I'm hoping that you've that we are learning from what happened there. And I, I, I'm telling you now that if, if you think South Seminole, Southeast Seminole Heights, if you think Seminole Heights is loud, just wait till South of Gandhi has issues. So I'm really hoping that we can uh, learn from what went on to have more robust communication, personal communication, uh, a lot more communication, and that we really focus on trash, on the professionalism of the subcontractors with the public, and uh, and the other issues that have come up, but mainly communication and making sure that anything that happens that residents know what's happening, because this is gonna impact them for quite some time. I know that we'll all be happy when it's over, but they still have to live through it. So yes, I know we talked about that, but I just wanna reiterate it on the record and make sure that, uh, that we are learning from those areas. So I will be looking for updates on that, and I will also be uh, asking the folks south of Gandhi how their experience is going. So we, we will stay on top of that the way we're staying on top of the Southeast Seminole Heights. And we will be happy to provide that. I um, can guarantee that Kimmins has a very robust plan, and um, they've been keeping an eye on that other project too to make sure that you know that a, a repeat of some of those things don't happen. I really do appreciate that. That would be um, a wonderful thing to see. So thank you. You're welcome. There, there. Councilman there, there. Scott, I, and I, I agree with what you're saying, Councilman. Remember her attack. Uh, this is a different contract. This is not the one that starts with an M. It starts. Uh, <laughs> with a K, and there's one other one that does great work in uh, Dallas, I believe, starts with a D. I'm sorry I said the name. D and K do fantastic work as far as I'm concerned. The other one can go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm glad to see it's, uh, it's Kimmins. In my experience, I see uh, John Zeminus is, is in the crowd, but um, especially on West Shore, Estrella, and all that, which was yeah. a major project, um, John picked up the phone every single time, was responsive within 30 minutes, an hour. You know, I mean, when I say responsive, I'm gonna be out on the site, I'm gonna talk to the neighbors, we met out there, we met with neighbors, and you know, we tried to be, working together, we tried to be very, very responsive. So Kimmins, in my opinion, has always done excellent work. And that's with, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, looking at the construction site, looking at the box culverts, talking to John, I mean, you know, I, I, I can't complain, even, and that was a major project with a lot of community complaints, but he was very, very responsive, and things worked out. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Who would like to move the resolutions? I, I apologize, Mr. Chair. Okay. I, oh, let's you. jump on it. We, All right. Thank we you. we got city work to do. Again, we've, we've shared this in our uh, individual briefings throughout the week, but it is worth noting that approval of this agreement does incorporate about $25 million worth of debt service that we'll be bringing to council along with the reimbursement resolutions that we've talked about. Again, the reimbursement resolution will allow us to begin work, expedite this, and get paid back. Uh, from the debt service. Thank you. Sorry about that. Move the resolution. Second. For which one? Seven. Second. We can move it together. Oh, move seven and eight. Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goose. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Chartet? Yes. Carlson? Goose? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Agenda item number 10, Ms. Johns. File number CM22-75389. Good afternoon. Um, you asked us to look at the letter the residents received for Timber, Fall, for Timber Falls to determine if there was any violations of laws. I can... Um, only comment on any violations of city code. There are no city code ordinances that cover the required notices by a landlord for collection of back rent and or eviction. That is covered by Florida State Statute Chapter 83. There is a provision that provides for specific language that needs to be included in that notice, but that is something that a court would determine whether the requirements were met um, I do want to let you know that we have been working with Bay Area Legal about that pilot program that we've been talking about. This is something that the tenants could take through that program. If they had an issue with the landlord notice, this program does provide for assistance for landlord tenant issues. I will be coming before you October 6th with that agreement. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ms. Johns, thank you for your hard work in, in that regard. And we spoke on it um, earlier this morning. So, so it would appear that no city ordinances were violated. What I was going to ask you to do, if I may, is, is to look to see if we have the legal capacity to draft a city ordinance that would deal with, and I'll make a formal motion, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, may I make a motion really quickly? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I, I make a motion to have legal come back with us on the feasibility of an ordinance that would preclude that. Let's see, how shall I place it? An, an ordinance dealing with situations where tenants are potentially being evicted for alleged debts that are six months old or, or six months or older, uh, back due debts which they had no idea of, et cetera. That's my motion. I know that we may run into some issues with Florida statutes on landlords, so we may not be able to do that, but at least look at the, the, the feasibility of that um, and have that come back uh, all uh, December. Uh, is that enough time for you? Okay, the first week in December, if I may. That's my motion. Um, but b before I formally put that out there, I know that on Monday, so I've kept in touch, obviously, with the Timber Falls folks and the management as well as the residents. We've been out there a number of times, and I believe there have been 19 open code enforcement cases so um, o over at Timber Falls. So my message to the, to the community at Apartments that are substandard is that the city of Tampa is open for business whenever it comes to taking a look at code enforcement challenges in some of these uh, uh, apartment areas, et cetera. I'm going out again on Monday with code enforcement. I've let um, uh, city staff know. I've let management at Timber Falls know. Because uh, again, we want to work on them to do better, right? We want to work on them to do better. So um, yeah, so that's my motion. Mr. Chairman. Good. Mr. Bill, can you repeat, repeat the motion? I, I'm not a, a clear was, about this was, six months. I'm not. It was convoluted. So my motion, uh, Councilman, essentially asked for legal to see the feasibility of an ordinance um, that would that would provide protections for tenants that are seeking to be evicted by landowners for debts that are six months or older, kind of like what happened, what allegedly is happening here. 
what protections um, the, uh, the, the city of Tampa can provide to tenants in such situations where they're seeking to be evicted for debts that are six months or older. And it's on the feasibility of it if an ordinance can be crafted. So it's not to come back with an ordinance, to come back with a report on the feasibility of it. Debts this, that, are, that, that the tenant didn't pay their rent for six months? What are we saying? A debt that just well, that are cured, they don't know that are cured? I mean, I'm, it, I'm, it could I'm, be either one. In this particular situation, according to the tenants, there were many debts that they didn't know about. Right. Right? I, I, maybe I things that. that Section 8 didn't pay for, maybe right. things that Catholic Charities, what, what, a, a charity, whatever it may be, Lutheran, whatever, uh, didn't pay for. So debts that they did not know of that are six they months or older. Okay, now, now, Absolutely. Now, now I'm a little more closer. Yes. Now, John, make, that, make sure if you bring it, that's a little more clear when you say yeah. debts that are old. That's what happens when okay. I think out loud. Okay. All right. So, you know, <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Councilman right. Brad, did you want to add anything? No, no, no. I'm, I'm staying out of that fray right now because if you have a contract and it ends and you have a new contract, so I, I understand what you're trying to say. So if the new contract is three or four or five hundred dollars more, they don't pay it. That's a problem. I mean, it, 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 the monies that we're giving for them to stay there, I appreciate it very much. I'm sure they do too. But somewhere along the line, it's going to end. Sure. And then what are we going to do? Sure. And, and, and mine goes to, for example, there are certain situations where third party entities, Section 8, different other entities, are paying people's rent and they didn't know that Section 8, for example, may be behind and it's six, seven months old, and then they're suddenly allegedly due for it. They may now be evicted. Right to the point. Right. Yes, sir. That, so that's the I potential know. situation. I doubt we can because obviously there's a the Florida statute 95.11 that deals with statute of limitations on contracts, debts, et cetera. But again, look mm -hmm. into if there is some level of protection without interfering with private contracts or Florida statutes that preempt us some sort of a protection. I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm not uh, optimistic, but something. Thank you. We have a uh, motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. What Thank is that date December in December? First. First week of May. December 1st. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Agenda item <laughs> number 12, file number CM22-76856. Good afternoon, Council. Sharisha Hills, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, here to talk about item number 12, which is the agreement with the Russo Brothers, are also known as the Hit Factory Academy. Um, I think you guys asked me to speak about their agreement. So their current agreement with us is a uh, FAP, which is a facility, I'm sorry, FUP, which is a facility use permit. This is a permit that we uh, utilize with organizations that are <coughs> sports leagues outside of little leagues. Uh, our traditional little leagues uh, use a FUA, Facility Use Agreement, mm -hmm. which is more exclusivity to that facility and have full access to the facility versus a FUP, which is a scheduled, you schedule with the City of Tampa Parks and Rec to utilize that facility. So um, they, Walls would literally transition from a little league. Um, they are no longer a little league. They are just, they have organizations there that utilize that facility. So we transition the permit uh, that is required for them. Councilman Maniscalco. When was that permit transition? Were, were the, was the hit factory under the previous style where they had essentially all access to now, uh, you know, someone unlocks the gate, opens a clubhouse kind of thing? Correct. So we, we were audited from our city auditors right before COVID. Uh, the audit came back that there was no longer Little League operating at Wellswood Little League. There was a hit factory who was a baseball academy. Uh, COVID hit in 2020. So things shut down in 21. We put them on a this uh, permit. We renewed it in 22 of this year. Um, so this would be the second year. They're still currently on it. Uh, still are able to use Wells with Little League. Um, but that's where the transition started. Actually started in 21 all with the new permit. But they're on a schedule. So for example, Correct. if it's like the gate is locked and it's raining and they want to get inside the, the clubhouse, they have like a two-story facility there on site. Mm -hmm. They have to wait for somebody in Parks and Rec to open it up or Parks and Rec can say, sorry, you know, it's sunrise, it's sunset or nine to five or you're outside, you know, it's 501, can't, sorry, we're closed for the day. Um, what, what's the situation there? So traditionally, if there's a rain out, you know, you could most like other organizations go back to your car or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, yes, yeah, so we open and close it that's there. You schedule to use the field. Uh, 
they're one of 70 organizations we permit uh, to utilize under the FUP uh, for permits. So yes, if they're there, if there's someone there to open it, we can open it and have them go in there. If not, like anything else, if you're out of football, you're out of basketball, you retreat back to your vehicle for safety. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Customer Goods. Mr. Medica, I'm familiar with the user agreements. I've used them for many, many years. And as you know, I've talked about a lot of issues that need to be transitioned with youth sports, uh, with recreation, especially with dealing with football. As you know, a lot of issues going on. I just teach you some stuff about football. Uh, I'm not in favor of for-profit programs getting the same incentives as uh, non-profit programs. Because for-profit programs, and that's where youth sports has kind of changed, we have a lot of these elite programs that are making money. Uh, and I have a problem when you have getting trying to get city uh, facilities and getting the same type of, of agreements as the uh, nonprofits because the nonprofits are catering to the community. They're not picking and choosing kids to play. They're not charging these fees. And then with for profit, they're charging a fee at the gate, whereas nonprofits cannot charge fees at the gate, donations, which is called, to help operate their programs. That's why I asked about the youth sports organization for all the county, cities to get together. That way, these programs who are failing or have issues can have a uh, commission that can help them and money can be generated to help these nonprofit programs. I'm for youth sports all day long, but I'm not for profit organizations getting the same type of benefits as nonprofits because they are making a profit versus being able to help all of the general community in that area. I have experience on this. I've dealt that with a lot of these youth programs and I'll call themselves an LLC. You know, I have issues with that. If you're a true nonprofit, you should be gaining and getting kids right there, not trying to make money off the backs of kids or paying coaches to coach. Volunteers are volunteers. So for me, uh, I've I, I read some of the background. I know the Russo brothers from Hillsborough and Plant High School. Great guys, great organization they're doing. But uh, I think that when you talk about incentives, I'm not for, for, for profits getting the same type of incentives. To me, that's club, and you're catering to a certain type of kid. But I am for nonprofits, making sure we can help everybody. But again, helping the for profits, but making sure there are different type of incentives. Yes, sir. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, let's let's go back a little bit in history. When I played at Cascade Park, by the way, that park is the only one that I know that's got two individuals in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Tony La Russa and Al Lopez. Yeah. Maybe the only two in the United States that has two in the Hall of Fame, who knows? So there was no Little League then, it was City League. And the city couldn't wait to get rid of the coaches and get rid of the, the people that were there so they could save the money. And that was Miss Mexico who did the females and Andrew Spolita who did the males. And we had three or 400 kids, only two people there. Did we learn? We learned because we only we were taught and we looked and we had to emulate what they taught us because there were so many kids that we couldn't get properly organized. Organization we had, but commitment to teaching you how to throw a curve, how to throw a knuckleball, that was gone. You had to learn it on yourself. You're smiling because you're in my list. And the next thing, <laughs> the next thing is, Little League came on. Little League flourished for many years, but now it's fluttering down. And you can correct me anytime you want from what I see. The difference is that in Little League now, they're playing the old baseball. You've got to be in your bag until you're 14 years old. You can't steal second until the, pet, the catcher gets the ball. It's antiquated. It's not the real baseball. And from what I see, and I'm not saying this is a fact, from what I see, like when I drive to go to my favorite place, Walmart, and I go by West Tampa Little League, I see it vacant most of the time. I don't think they got 100 kids there. And West Tampa one time had six or seven or 800 kids. They had seven or eight 12 year olds playing. I think they got one. I can verify this by getting my information. In fact, some of the kids that went there from the Fogueras family, I know I talked to them the other day, how are you girls doing at West Tampa? She said, they're not at West Tampa anymore. I said, where are they at? They're at the hit factory. The parents are the ones that are driving this thing. If there's a need, and no one's paying, the need goes away. 
But when every parent in America thinks that their daughter and their sons are going to be professional <laughs> in basketball or tennis or you football, right they think that they're going to make it up. And God, thank, again, my father told me I was terrible. That's why I didn't make it. But what I'm trying to tell you is that all these parents want somebody to babysit, but they don't want to go to a little league. They want somebody getting paid to teach them. That's what the deal is. As far as I see, even when you go in some little leagues, they still send the kids somewhere for practice by somebody who's a professional. And let me say this before Mr. Russo's here, Paul, Paul was one of my catchers. I'm not here because of Paul. I'm not here to talk. I'm talking about the facts. And I don't know what contract they have or don't contract. I've never read it. But from what I hear, and it wasn't from Paul that told me that there's some individual from the park that opens the gate and closes the gate, and he stays there and gets paid for them to watch the practice. I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe I should be saying it. That's what I heard. It was from Mr. Russo. So what I'm saying is, what is it about? It's about the kids being at some place for some period of time to learn about what? When you play sports, it's not you're going to be a professional that you learn how to deal with others. And you learn about what? You learn about winning, and you learn about losing. And what makes a winner is somebody who doesn't want to lose. And what makes a great employee is somebody who wants to be better than the one next to them. And life teaches you about sports. No wonder I lost so many baseball games. So what I'm trying to tell you is that in life, it's who you hang out with. This old thing in Spanish that tells me, don't tell me who you are. Tell me who you hang around with, and I'll tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. And that still goes in society today. So what I'm trying to say, it's about all the kids that are there. What happens if this organization leaves, and you said 70, they have 70 of these teams like that? I don't know. We permit 70, well, yes, sir. Whatever. So let's say that they all vanish tomorrow. Where are the kids going? To the street? They're not going back to where they came from. They don't want to be there. Their parents are telling them, you're going to be a star. Maybe one in 10,000 makes it. That's a fact. He made it. It wasn't because of me, because he was a better player than the rest of them. I had many of them go to the majors from there and West Tampa. One guy paid for the Yankees for five years. But what I'm saying is it wasn't because I coached him. He was already a star. I just told him, listen, don't throw curves. You're winning nine to nothing. Let's go home. Throw fastballs. That's all I told the kids. Because today's life, the parents are see this glamorous thing, and, and God bless them that they do. And God bless them that they send them to a university. And I can't tell you how many, I, I, I'm going to have them come up, and, and, and I'm going to ask them some questions about what does that program produce in scholarships to kids, kids that maybe would have never made it, nowhere else, not even a college education. What has it done? How many kids went to college? How many kids got a scholarship? The return on the dollar is so much greater than what we think. And I'm not here to chastise the department. I'm not doing that. But what I'm saying is we have to look at a much bigger picture if somebody's renting it or not renting. I assume he's making payments on something. I don't know what. I can tell you the years ago I went and the left field, the right center field fence in the big park was falling down. The place was in horrible condition. I don't know if it's his maintenance, your maintenance. The sidewalk was all cracked up. I had 10 years of service there. It were the 10 best years of my life. In fact, two kids saved me from a lot of grief. And when they came on the team, I told them they weren't good enough to play, but that I was not going to get in their way. I would teach them what I knew, and I didn't want them to swing. I didn't just didn't want them to get hurt. One of them now is the, what? The chief of staff in the city of Miami. And the other one is a big guy, the broker in the real estate business. And I'm so proud of them. And they turned out to be great citizens. Not because of me, but because they were around other kids that were teaching them that. And I told them in the beginning, they're five years ahead of you. Don't get hurt. If you hear somebody say, I got it, stop. Don't run them over because they're much stronger than you are right now. So these are the things that you have to instill in them. Winning is not for everybody. It's for everyone. Because if you get up and you do what you got to do, you will become a winner. You just can't take it on the ground sitting down. And that's what I think that these, all these 70 organizations, and I don't know the other 69, put in the kids' heads that you just can't go with an L. You got to do with a W 
to try to get your race DL. It's about life. It ain't about just sports. It's about life. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Councilman Goods. Ms. Hills, you know, and again, Ms. Moran is right. You know, I, I love good coaches. You know, I do. I'm, I'm strictly about how they dress, how they teach kids. That's just my mental, my motto on that. Uh, my only concern is, again, uh, if it's open space, let's utilize it. But my thing is incentives. I want to know what the incentives are with the nonprofit for profit because I just want to make sure that, you know, we, we can't have the same. Because, I mean, but because if people are getting paid and, 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 and doing this other thing, you got other people that are volunteering their time. You know, I know with a lot of my leagues, when I was in charge of a lot of them, we had non-exempt uh, clauses and things like that. We got a little uh, extra on the dollar to where we can be able to afford to play and things like that. But I just want to know about the incentive. That's my biggest issue is what are we getting for the book? And, and that reminds me, Mr. Good, when you say for profit or not profit, even in the legal league, little league, Parents have to pay. You have to pay to join up, you have a fee. Then you're required to work so many hours in the concession stand. Then you have to help with a field. You have so many things you gotta do. And now, I mean, I like it. More likely I couldn't make the team. But what I'm saying is all these things have to be in consideration. And Mr. Russo, can you bring us up to date what you do? I, I, I'm not here to create, I wanna solve this problem once and for all. Sure. That's what the incentives are. What are the, what are the different incentives? Are we, are we going to, are you asking for Mr. Russo? Yes. To come Mr. Russo, can you please come I, I up? I asked for Ms. Hills first to talk about the okay, incentives. Okay, okay, okay. Excuse me, I'm sorry. No, you take sure. over. No, I'm not taking over, sir. I thought no, I did no, ask. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, ahead. Go ahead madam. Yeah, come on. Ms. Teresa Hills, come on. go ahead. I'm sorry, what was the question, sir? No, I didn't pass it on. What was the question, sir? I'm sorry. I Council asked what the difference in incentive, the incentives for reference for profit versus non-profit. That's what I wanted to talk about. Incentive. So the difference is that, like a little league compared to an uh, academy and organization. Uh, yeah, club, club okay. ball, travel ball. Okay, so with the little league, so the, the biggest thing is that they have exclusive, exclusivity to that field or that, that complex. So they have the first priority, first right to refusal. Uh, we have other travel ball organizations that do practice at little leagues, but they have to operate outside of the little league schedule. Okay, so the little leagues, their practices, their games come first, and then the uh, academies or travel ball sports come second. Um, we do with the little leagues, we pay their utilities, we cover all of those expenses. The little leagues are responsible for their infields and the maintenance of their infields. Now, that being said, if we have a little league that uh, needs help with it, we do assist with that. Uh, academies, organizations, for-profits, we do all the maintenance, we be in the city. So that's where it comes in, where we unlock it. So we go, we do all the maintenance, we still pay the utilities, we maintain all of that that organization, all they have to do is come in, practice, and walk out. So it's, I, I can compare it to almost like a rec center versus, you know, it's like our agreement with the Boys and Girls Club when they have a facility, they maintain everything, they, they carry it on, versus someone who wants to come in, councilman goes, you just want to rent the facility for a day or for every other day. You come in, we unlock the door, we let you in, we come back, we lock the facility. So those are a little bit of the, the differences out of there. Thank you. So, and then also the Little Leagues, uh, clearly they don't pay for the facility. So. That agreement is, is also, there, also there as well. There's no payment there, but they do maintain it. And you're right, Councilman uh, Miranda, there's volunteer hours, there's services put back in there that, that's done there as well. So. Ms. Russo. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Chief of Staff and City Council for allowing me to come and speak. There were some things said there that were true, but Hit Factory Baseball and Softball Academy is a nonprofit association. Okay, we're a nonprofit organization. We're 501c3. We do pay our coaches, just like the YMCA is a nonprofit and they pay their employees. So in 2015, we went to Mr. Miranda, my brother and I, as Hit Factory, and we asked to take over a defunct league. Little League Baseball had not been at Wellswood since the early 90s, early 90s. So we didn't take over till 2015. So the early 90s, Little League left Wellswood. It became Pony Baseball, a different organization. Okay, so it became Pony Baseball. Well, in the year of 2015, Pony, uh, Wellswood lost its Pony Baseball charter. So it had no charter whatsoever. 
So we came to Mr. Miranda, my brother and I, and said there was 30 kids that registered that have no place to go. Can Pat and I take over the facility? We would make those three teams travel teams, and then I would call all the travel organizations around the city that I knew to come play at Wellswood so the park would stay viable and the park would stay alive. Since 2015, we have saved the city of Tampa over $250,000. My brother and I, Hit Factory, and our new uh, partner, Vince Scanio, have put that money into the facility through renting of the fields and full maintenance of the facility. Not one thing has been done to Wellswood fields from the city of Tampa Park and Recreations for 30 years. I know because I played there at six years old for Mr. Miranda. Everything that has been done at that complex where it comes to replacing grass, replacing clay, all the cutting of the grass, we have done since 2015, our dollars. And a lot of our dollars come in from donations. Like I say, we're a 501c3. We have an annual golf tournament. We have an annual poker night. We have 20 to 25 percent of our children that play for us are on scholarship because one thing I will never do is not let a child play because he can't afford it. For those that don't know what I've done for, for a living, I was born and raised here, played at Wellswood, played at West Tampa, and then played at the poorest little league in Tampa at the time, which was Riverside Little League, which is now the Yellow Jackets Park. So I played at the University of Tampa for uh, three years, became an All-American there, played on the USA national team in 1987, and then played professional baseball for 11 seasons with the Twins, Padres, Yankees, and Astros. So that's where my background of baseball comes from. And since 1990, the year I got drafted, we have given free baseball clinics to anybody. For poor kids, rich kids, doesn't matter, free. We've done coaching clinics at different high, um, excuse me, at different little leagues. We have done baseball and softball camps for the Boys and Girls Club that we had for three years and then Right, right at, as COVID hit, then they didn't renew the contract because they were doing something with the NFL. So we had over 100 kids three, for three years in a row at Wellswood uh, promoting baseball and softball. Um, there are some things that have been said that aren't true because the biggest softball organization in the, in the city of Tampa is run by Parks and Recreations, and it's called Team Tampa. And they have the best facility in the city of Tampa. The best facility in the city of Tampa. And if you, if, I know I passed out a booklet for everybody to look at. If you look at this booklet, I can tell you there's been no changes at Wellswood for 30 years, despite the amount of money that our organization has put into it and the maintenance that we've done. So right now we have a situation where we have, there's a school called Trinity School for Children, which is a half a block away from the ballpark. We have eight to 10 kids that play for our organization from Trinity. Those eight to 10 kids come to practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So those kids don't have the ability to be picked up from school. They don't have the ability to go to daycare. Their parents work till late. So we would get to the field early, meaning myself, my brother, and Vince Gagno. Those three kids would have a safe haven to be at. They would come upstairs with us, do their homework, sit down, relax, but they had a safe place to go, all for no charge, all for no charge. And we gave them the ability to have a safe place. Now those children had nowhere to go. I talked to a couple of parents. They go sit at the bowling alley for two and a half hours before they can get into the ballpark for their practice. We have been told in several city meetings that, or I'm sorry, park and rec meetings, that we would have the ability to use the upstairs and the concession stand. Right now, the concession stand has been closed since July. We personally have at least $30,000 worth of 
concession equipment just sitting there rotting away. I don't know if the Park and Recs Department pays for termite service or rodent service, but we did that every month for the last seven years. There's already rats running back around the ballpark. We saw them the other day because I don't know if that service is provided anymore in the last two months. Since we have not been at the ballpark taking care of the fields, the fields are already overgrown. They already have lips on the back of the infield. There's grass growing over things because it's not cared for the way we would care for it. On a regular day, my brother and our other partner, Vince Scanio, live in the Wellswood community, two blocks away from the field. My brother's normal day would, seven, 11 o'clock in the morning, he would go to the park, he would water and drag all the fields. If they needed to be cut or trimmed, he would do that. He would leave the ballpark, go home, do whatever, and at three o'clock, we would be back at the ballpark for those kids to come from Trinity. We have a tremendous working agreement with Trinity School for Children. So with Trinity School for Children, we have this working agreement where their teams come play on the fields at Wellswood. They pay park and recreation for the right to use those fields. But the park and recreation department does not pay for the maintenance of those fields. We take care of it. The park and recreation department didn't pay for the new clay or all the materials that needed to be on the field, we paid for that. But Park and Recreation got paid and we got no compensation and we did all the work because we were in charge of the facility. If you walked into the facility now and a couple of uh, council uh, men walk, walked to the facility and they saw it and they were lucky to get in because they, had, uh, they were cutting the grass that day, but they couldn't walk through the field because the grass was too high. Our pitchers can't use the bullpens because the grass is too high. And it's not taken care of to the level that we took care of the field. And that's, that's all we're saying. I, listen, if they want to cut the grass, they cut the grass. But we really need use of the upstairs facility and a concession stand. The economic impact we have on the community is unbelievable with Mr. Empanada, the Mambo's restaurant, and, uh, and uh, Mickey's sandwich shop. So respectfully, I request uh, if we could have a private meeting uh, to cover more of this, I, I, would, I would truly appreciate it. I have no problem with Ms. Hills or Ms. Erickson. I think they're wonderful women and they do a great job. I just would like to resolve it, and uh, especially for the kids, because those are those ones that are paid a cost. If, 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 if I can, Ms. Hills, would you, would you like to respond to that? No, I mean, I. I Thank you, sir. Yes, um, no, I mean, we can absolutely sit down and talk about it. I, we go back 20 years, um, and, and he's right. It, it's, we just need, we can sit down and discuss what sis, what sits across our upstairs concession stand and things of that nature. Um, for us, we just want to make sure, and I'll just keep saying this, the agreement that's with them is consistent with the same organizations that are just like them. With the other 69 organizations that we have, that is our biggest thing, ensure that it's consistent and we do want access for all the same goal he wants, the access for all, for everyone to have that opportunity. That is our goal in Parks and Rec. That has not changed. Um, but really the agreement itself is, is really our thing. It's just making sure we're consistent with that. So, but I have no problem. I know he requested to meet separately. I don't know if that was with me, maybe not. Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, Councilman, <laughs> Councilman Miranda. I, um, I'm thinking how to solve this, and the only thing I can think of is maybe Ms. Hills can get an appointment with the Chief of Staff and, and Mr. Paul Russo and they work it out. I, I, I mean, I, that's the only thing I can think of. We don't do contracts. We either approve them or reject them. That's what we do. But talking about that, I'm going to meet you and the lady in the back, and you and I are going to have a little game. You and keep you're not going to win. You keep you're saying that. You're going to be embarrassed when an 82-year-old man put a whooping on you. You're the second city That's person this you. week. The public's invited. I will take your lunch money. I told somebody this earlier. I, I don't care about the age. I will take well, your lunch money. Well, now I know you're least expensive. Usually it was dinner. Now it's only lunch. It's only lunch. But Challenge him to one-on-one -on -one in basketball. I know he'll lose. Councilman Mascalco. So the agreement is consistent with the other 69 organizations. Yes. But do they put in the same investment, as Mr. Russo said, a quarter of a million dollars in maintenance and upkeep and everything else? Are these other organizations doing what the, the Hit Factory and the Russo brothers are doing? Because it seems like they're taking the burden off the taxpayers and the city maintaining these fields because 
they're taking their 501c3 funding or donations, whatever, and they're putting it towards the maintenance of this park, which otherwise would, the cost would fall on us. It depends on the location. So some of these other, or the other organizations are at Little Leagues, which those Little Leagues are maintaining the fields. So those outside organizations are getting the benefits of the, that current Little League maintaining the inside. Some of the fields are ours, like Roman Sly, on the corner of Roman Sly Park. The city maintains those. Um, so it all depends on the location. But we don't have a lot of fields. So some of these organizations are at the Little Leagues, which he's right, the Little Leagues do maintain their own. So these other organizations are benefiting from the little leagues that are being on there, very similar to how he was saying Trinity was at the facility that you know they would maintain. Because at the beginning of the conversation, I heard that the agreement that, that people have are they go in, they use the fields, they go home, and then the city takes care of all the maintenance. Now, you said that we maintain some, others privately maintain their own, this and that. But the thing is, and I don't know how the other organizations are, but they're offering, you know, before school, after school services, whatever it is, you know, not call it babysitting, but, you know, students are coming in, they're being able to use the facilities, uh, students that don't have parents that are able to pick them up because they're working, you know, we're keeping them out of trouble, essentially, off the streets and, and keeping them occupied. Um, but as Councilman Miranda mentioned, I think, you know, we, you, John Bennett, uh, whoever else has a meeting with the uh, with Mr. Russo, Mr. Russo's brother, and try to resolve this. I see it as a community benefit. You know what they're doing, not to treat them differently, but you know the investment that they've <coughs> been making for so many years, and what it saved the taxpayers because again they're using that funding. Um, I think makes them unique to the other possibly 69 other uh, individuals that we have agreements with. All right. Chair, one last thing. Mr. Mascoke, you're, 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 you're right. Well, I think what happens is this, and I think Mr. Russo said, I think the league was a uh, little league for a long time. It went defunct, and with the pony ball, I remember that, I remember that well. Because yes, uh, Wellswood used to be a, a great place to play at. Uh, and I know the city kind of tries to hold those fields a little bit for little league programs in case one comes back, because little league is a chart program by the United States, and there's only three of them, which is them and the Boy Scouts and one other. Uh, but since Ms. Russo said they're a nonprofit, uh, yes, you have to verify whatever, they're a nonprofit, I don't know that the, the takeover could be because they're a nonprofit now and they go under the guidelines of a nonprofit. But again, I look at the, the, what, what, his nonprofit, what, his, what his nonprofit is doing versus other nonprofits. And can, that's the can, only challenge can, I have. Can I say today. something? I don't want to take over anything. Okay. I, I want to have a, a, I love Sharisha. I te, I, I've known her since I was young. I'm now old. So I, I have nothing against her. I have nothing against Heather. I want to be able to have a wonderful working agreement with them. We're, we're in this together. We're in it for kids. Oh, that was trying to help Listen, I'm, I'm, oh, no, no, I understand. No, I know, I know what you're saying. I'm not here to get rich. I played baseball for 11 years. I'm, I've, been I've been retired longer than I played. And it gave me a good life. Baseball gave me a good life. I want my dream for the kids that I coach, boys and girls, is I want them to have the opportunities to do the things I did. And that's, and you know, my son's a head coach now at Tampa Catholic. He, he played here. He uh, was also a professional baseball player for the Washington Nationals. Uh, I'm going to be a grandfather, I found out, a baby boy on the way, so, so, um, but, you know, we were playing at the Yankee Complex the other day, and my goal for our kids is for them to be able to play on those type of fields. If you go to Pinellas County and look at those fields, they're immaculate, and I know it's all based on budget, but, you know, that, that's what I want to provide for these kids is I don't care if they play professional baseball. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. Mr. Russo, yes, with sir. all due respect to you, yes, sir. if you look at the people behind you, some of those have 130 appointments. Oh, I know, City I know. Council. Yeah. It seems to me, and I think I, Mr. Moran to get I'll on leave. it, <laughs> you have a contractual agreement with Parks and Recreation. Yes, sir. You all need to get together and decide yes, what's going to happen. Yes, sir. Councilman Miranda. Just to mention history, I believe Wellswood 
the, one of the first girls base, a softball team to win the Little League Yes, World they World were. Series. Yes, they were. And on the other side of West Tampa, the boys won it one year. Yeah. I forget what year it was. I had yes. curls, I believe. And they, they won it. Yeah. But I can tell you we that, will the, get team together, that I the team that Mr. Russo played for, the only team to ever beat West Tampa. That's right. And Ursel's team in, uh, in one year. And we beat them both three to two. Right. Both Thank times. you very much, and you have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Agenda item number 12, file number CM22-73220, to be heard with agenda item 14, CM22-73825. Which one is that? School director's insurance. You said agenda item 13, correct? Yes. That is correct. 13, 13, 14. Rebecca Johns, assistant city attorney. Um, you asked us to come back and report on director's insurance, which regarding local government is public official liability insurance and any options out there. Um, I just want to start off because I don't know that we've discussed qualified immunity or absolute immunity before, but I just want to make it clear to everyone that if council is sued as a body because of a vote that you took, you have absolute immunity from that. So if you get sued, that will be dismissed based on the immunity. If you get sued as an individual, which is actually rare, but if you get sued as an individual, the city's policy um, tracks what other jurisdictions in Florida do. So the city decides, the city can reimburse you, and they decide that based on whether the alleged action occurred during the performance of the official duties and occurred while the official was serving a public purpose and the official prevails in the litigation. So in that instance, across Florida, you see that is when a city reimburses the, for the legal fees. Um, it's a general Florida rule that the government does not provide a legal defense or pay for outside counsel at the onset of the litigation because it's difficult to determine at the beginning of litigation whether those prongs were met. So I just want to, I know we've all talked about that, but I just want to put that out there again to clarify. So do you have any questions about that aspect first? Any questions, John? Okay. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have our insurance broker all the way from Texas who needs to get on a plane soon, so. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Valerie horton Rakes. I am the city's risk manager. Good to see each of you. We've had the opportunity to have have sessions with you so that you can get questions answered. And very quickly, we are getting ready to enter into our insurance renewal. Uh, it is a long process, but because we are getting ready to do that, I would like to let you know that we will be looking at ways to lower our SIR, uh, that self-insured retention. Um, and our broker is here. Her name is Tracy Hargrove. She'll step up for a minute if you have questions for her. Uh, during that process, we will hopefully be able to get quotes and be able to bring that information and share it with you. Uh, and I will pause to ask if you have any questions of me at this moment. Any questions? I, I think you've met with all Councilman Goods, you're recognized. I, I think we, you, we, you've met with all the council members and you've heard some of our concerns and discussion. So I'm hoping that you're going to be looking at that and bring that back when you finally make whatever deals you're going to make. Absolutely. And a footnote to that is we are also at the mercy of the insurance market, okay. but we would definitely do that. And based upon the things that have occurred thus far, I have talked with each of you except for one. And so I do have uh, information about your concerns and your frustrations. And that information will be used as we do our renewal for the upcoming year. Thank you. Any other questions? Would you like to speak with our broker? Does she have any information she'd like to give us? I believe they were very succinct in their, that what they provided to you. Um, really what you need to understand about insurance is, I, I know your concerns are about the deductible and the retention. The policy terms and conditions aren't going to be really different. They're still gonna provide basically the same coverage as you're seeing. You're just going to the coverages that are going to be in the policy may have a lower deductible to them. Councilman Miranda. Thank you much, Chairman. Uh, 
I assume that uh, from what I heard, even though it was put in a, in a very different text, that we would, were, what we understood to be, even though it wasn't said, is that the city would provide coverage from their legal staff if one of the council members or the council members in general get sued by an outside third party. Am I correct? Yeah, I can't speak to that. <laughs> If you get sued as counsel right. performing a counsel function, then yes. Now I'm getting to the other part. However, if we commit an act, or I commit an act, not we, I commit an act, and I'm told you have to do A, B, and C, and I don't do them, then you're going to tell me I'm not going to represent you. Am I correct? Well, it depends what A, B, and C okay, are. Okay, I, I understand uh, that. If, However, if, if it's clear that from the alleged act or the complaint that you were performing your official duties. Right, and then the other part is, then you're also gonna tell me, you hire your own attorney, if you win, we're gonna pay the attorney, am I correct? If, if you win and it was determined that you were acting in your official capacity and furthering a public purpose, all right, so in other words, in my and case... I, I, and let me clarify, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to state that in a vacuum. No, of course, I, it depends on the facts I, and I'm circumstances. I'm just trying to clear my own mind because I guess I got, I'm a product of how I was raised. And I was raised, if you do something wrong, meaning me, no one else, it's up to you to pay for it. My father told me that. My mother told me that. My whole family told me that because when they raised you, everybody raised you, not only your mother and father when I was growing up. So there's a different pressure on you not to mess up. And I had to change the word mess up. I was going to use something else, but I didn't. Thank you very much. Councilman Goose. Well, not dealing with what Mr. Miranda said, but see, sometimes there's circumstances I get into play that happen. So we, I, I respect what you're saying uh, in the elder statements here, but sometimes there, 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 there are things that go awry and things that happen and, and, and then you have to come back, you have to fight on your own to do things. So I would say you're right on one accord, but on another court, there's another situation as well. I understand. And again, my thing is making sure that we don't have personal people do, making their own personal decisions versus looking at and making a decision and letting personal uh, factors come into play. That's my concern. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Uh, this is uh, this is my uh, my uh, uh, day two or day three of me being back, and I wasn't privy to the conversation for the previous item. I didn't. I wasn't aware the council met. Uh, it is relevant to mine, and I haven't had the opportunity to speak to our new uh, city attorney about that because the question is. Uh, what Ms. John said is that's related to a decision of the, uh, of the city attorney presently with regard to that, and I'm familiar with that because I was involved in an issue regarding reimbursement myself, which creates another issue. So, Council, it's a long agenda, but I'm going to ask your indulgence if you can continue this um, for uh, a couple of weeks to be able to me catch up because a lot of what I heard is a lot of what I would have said. So, um, with regard to um, what the law is. When do you so, want it to? When, uh, when, is do it you possible? Want it, when do you want to come back to Ms. Shelby? Is this October? Is it, yeah, either the 6th, is the 6th or the 20th? We have October 6th and October 20th. What's counsel's plan? I'll take, I'll take. What, what, what will give you an efficient time, Mr. Shelby? Well, I want to make sure I have the opportunity. Uh, the, the, uh, I'll take the 20th and that'll be it, sir. I'll be ready. Chairman, I move item 13 and 14 B. Put on the agenda for October 20th at uh, 1 30. We have a motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Goods. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name for the record, for our record. Valerie Horton Rakes, risk manager for the city of Tampa. We matter. are going into renewal and we won't really have any additional information for the October meeting. Uh, our renewal process, uh, we will begin to get quotes around February. Uh, early March, and so coming back in October, we would have no additional information. Could we? They, it's not necessary. They could separate. They don't have to travel together unless you want to set a separate date for it, or you could have them come back when they think they're ready. Yeah, once we get the information. 
I, Councilwoman Hertak. I, I moved that uh, we just. Um, number 15? Yeah, we just do number 14. 14. That we That's forward right. that uh, and then allow number 13 to come back when they have right. an answer. We absolutely will do that, and that is doing the end of end the renewal process, and we will bring all of the quotes and information to you so that you are able to review it to determine what it covers and the actual cost. Okay, so okay. October 20th uh, at 1.30 for uh, item number 14. Does it have to be 1.30? Staff 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 I'm report. sorry, yeah, somebody said 1.30, but staff report's okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if, if we already have one motion for which is Councilman Miranda's. Oh, sorry. For 20, yeah. Which one is it? For the 20th. For that is number 14. Right. Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we have a motion from Councilwoman Hertak for item agenda number 13. Correct. No. 13 is done. They're going to they're tell going them. They're going to come yeah, back when they come back. They're, yeah, they're just not being heard together. Okay. They're not moving forward. Together. No, they don't have to travel. I thought I heard you make a motion. No, sorry. Thank I was, you. I, I was repeating it. My apologies. Okay, uh, agenda number 15, file number CM22-75288. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, that, I guess, I'm not privy to discussion. I spoke with Mr. Massey about it very briefly. Um, I don't know what council's pleasure is at this time, or you can continue it because I have not had the opportunity to speak to all of you. So it's your pleasure, but I'm certainly uh, happy to hear what council has to say about it. But it's late, and if council wishes to continue it, that would be hard time. Um, to me, this is an issue that uh, could be dealt with under the September 22nd workshop session because I believe this actually kind of deals with the charter and in, in, in our and our staffing. I would agree. Okay, so um, if we want to talk about it with, um, oh yeah, it, right here, here it is. Um, council to discuss charter amendments. Um, in addition, give the city council attorney to write the right to hire staff and outside consultants subject to a budget that is approved by council and the mayor. Yeah. So that is on the let's let's deal with it then. Let's combine those. Yeah. We'll, so then move to continue. We'll move to combine item 15 with is uh, it next week's workshop. Yes, with September 22nd item. workshop so. for with the with the line item about hiring staff and outside consultants. Perfect. Whose motion is this? Mine. Yep. His. I'll second that. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hertak. All in favor? Aye. Is there any opposed? Uh, I believe 16 was continued October 17th? No? Okay. Not yet. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council Abby Feely, uh, Deputy Administrator, Development and Growth Management. Um, items 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Um, those were the publicly initiated text amendments that we workshopped with you on June 23rd. This is allowing ADUs, um, accessory dwelling units in non-conforming structures, allowing extended family residences in non-conforming structures, access to the local street, uh, allowing single family attached and multifamily within uh, the city's office and commercial districts. What I did was I provided you with a memo. I provided you with the draft language today. Um, in anticipation of asking that we come on October 22nd to workshop these items with you. Uh, this allows some time now for review of that language. It allows it for the public. Um, Eric Cotton is waiting till you make a motion today and then we will get it uploaded on our website with the applicable dates so that um, they are aware we are gonna hold a public information meeting on September 28th. Um, with to get an initial discussion going with the public on these and then we will have the initial briefing with the Planning Commission prior to coming to you for workshop but I did want to give everybody an opportunity provide that language up front um, and ask for those dates today and that will clear those items yes. that language provided by email today how was it provided to council? came in a memo a couple days ago a couple days yeah okay, I'll catch up okay thank you Councilwoman Hertak. I have a copy if you need it. Councilwoman Hertak. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I just want to say thank you for all of your effort on this. And uh, I have read these. And I think, uh, again, I, I don't want to pass too much judgment because we really want to go through forward the public information, 
and the Planning Commission briefing, but I really uh, appreciate your effort to get us to this point, and I look forward to the workshop where, where we can really uh, finalize, the, or at least um, get these further, further uh, settled. And you'll remember in October we also have making ADUs a specified use, so that will actually change kind of this language, but it's a two-step process, mm -hmm. making affordable housing a specified use or attainable housing a specified use, um, and then also uh, some bonus density discussion. So we have those as well, so it'll be a very full day. I believe you're also having a memo come from Ms. Doc on two privately initiated amendments that are also being asked to be workshopped on that day, and that was the designated growth management workshop day. So thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On item number 16, I, as I talked to you yesterday on the phone on it, uh, I'm not against it, but I feel that the city, in order to cover itself, uh, you have to prove to me that that's a relative. And you can do that now real easy with different things in Century.com or whatever it is that they use to track who your mother is, your father is, your aunt, your uncle tells you everybody. And when they have that documentation, then I'm not against it. But today, I know of hundreds and maybe thousands of homes that are not paying the higher ad valorem tax, and they got the house divided into four pieces. They're renting rooms. They're not paying the Fed the 25 or 30 percent. They're not paying just all they're paying is a residential because it's under one person's name and there's three families living there and they're renting it out. They're not paying the ad valorem tax like three and a half times the break when you have the school system and others that can't have money for the teachers, enough money to keep good teachers or any teachers nowadays. I got to have more proof than just a signed document that, yeah, that's my relative. To me, that doesn't, I trust, but I always like to verify. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you, Ms. Feely. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. We'll schedule these items for what did you say? The 22nd of October, correct? 7th. 6th. 27th of October. A motion made by Councilman Mascock was seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Agenda item number 22, file number E2022-8, Chapter 21. Good afternoon, Council McLean Evans, Assistant City Attorney. Item number 22 is first reading of a substitute ordinance that is modifying uh, Section 21-116 and 116.1 to eliminate conflicting references to the Stormwater Technical Standards Manual and uh, correct references to the department. That number 17? 22. That's number 22. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, I missed that one. Any I'm here comments if you have or any questions? questions? Seeing none. Councilman Vieira. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, move an ordinance being or substitute ordinance being presented for first reading consideration an ordinance of the city of Tampa. Florida amending City of Tampa Code of Ordinances, Chapter 21, Article 3, state, uh, Section 21-116, and Article 4, Section 21-116.1, eliminating conflicting stormwater technical standards, manual edition references, correction department, or correction department name, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinance in, in conflict therewith, providing severability, providing an effective date, sure that, uh, in other words, do we have a system where someone buys a house and it's got part of it with papers or concrete and then it's settled and then all of a sudden they add more concrete and more payment. Do you have a way of finding out what's going on? Because they should pay a higher rate. Uh, all the rest of the taxpayers should pay that. Councilman Miranda, I apologize. I do not have staff on the line today because I thought questions would be specifically related to the language changed in well, the this ordinance. This is first reading, so we have time between now and first and second reading. Yes, sir. I will I coordinate with staff and have them get back right, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman uh, Miranda. Roll call vote. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hurtek? Yes. Carlson? Goose? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent. 
second reading and adoption will be held on October 6, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. File number 23, uh, excuse me, agenda item number 23. File number E, 2022-HF27. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Citro and Council Members. LaShawn Dock here with Development Coordination. And Council, item number 23 um, is before you for first reading. This is a privately initiated text amendment. The applicant is Ricky Paterica. <laughs> This request is to amend um, several sections of the Natural Resources Code. Um, some of it is um, cleanup um, and modifications to existing tables just to um, clarify certain standards. It includes a um, revision to the definition section of the code for the definition of grand tree. And um, this has been um, reviewed by staff. Um, the applicant worked with natural resources on this language and staff has no objections to this request. Um, the public information meeting was held in May, um, just to give you an idea on the timing and the processing schedule. They, um, it was before you for workshop council in June, and it went before the planning commission in August, and the planning commission had a recommendation of consistent. And I believe the applicant is there in chambers. Um, Ricky Paterica is there, and I'll let him speak since it is a privately initiated amendment. I'm available if you have questions, council. Any questions for Ms. Dock? Mr. Paterica. Thank you, Council. Ricky Paterica, 308 East 7th Avenue. Uh, I haven't been sworn if uh, I need to be. Okay. Don't need to be. Uh, uh, we presented this workshop about 45 days ago. Um, I thought it went pretty smoothly and had support, and I'd rather than extend this day further, hopefully I, I can adjust any questions if Council has it, but excited to see some of these things get on the books. Any questions for Mr. Paterica? I, Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Chairman, Mr. Federico, thank you for what you've done here, but I want to make sure that uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're responsible for this, but what I'd like to see is a clarity on when something comes in and you have so many trees that you have to plant somewhere else, is there a mechanism to your knowledge where you know where the trees are going and you put money into the fund and it balances out? I'm, I'll, I'll take care of To my way. knowledge, I don't think there is that right, thank you very much. translation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Uh, Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I'd like to read an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration an ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida relating to landscaping and grand trees, making revisions to the City of Tampa Code of Ordinances, Chapter 27, Zoning and Land Development, amending Section 27-43, Definitions, amending Section 27-211-13, Landscaping, amending section 27-284.1.2, trees protected, grant and exempt trees. Measurement methods, amending section 27-284.3.1, landscape and tree planting standards, tree <coughs> preservation and retention standards, amending section 27-284.3.3, landscaped area and tree planting requirements, and creating section 27-283.16, bicycle parking, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict therewith, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira, roll call vote. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent. Second reading and adoption will be held on October 6, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Agenda item number 24, file number E-2022-8, Chapter 27. Um, yes, thank you so much, um, Council. LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And Council, item 24 is another privately initiated text amendment. The applicant is Angela Rauber. She is um, requesting an amendment to the CBD, which is the Central Business District Sign Standards. Um, the request includes amending some of the general sign um, requirements which are found in table 183.1. .1. This would also modify um, certain footnotes within that table. Um, this is regarding the orientation of signage and what is considered frontage and the, allow the allowance of signage on any frontage. And this also includes um, adding sign language um, from the sign code, which would apply citywide to the CBD district, which is a special district within the city. And staff reviewed the request, has no objections to this request. This text amendment was on the same schedule as the previous text amendment. Um, it went before the Planning Commission in August. The recommendation was a finding of consistent. 
and I believe the applicant is there in chambers. Um, if not, she is present online. Any, um, and I'm available if you have questions. Any questions for Ms. Doc? Thank you. Yes, Thank you. I am present. I am Angela Halber uh, with Hillward Henderson, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard. And um, I'm also in the interest of time, if you have questions about this specifically, then I can answer those. If you want the full presentation, I'm happy to share that as well. But basically, as Ms. Doc said, we, we, we are looking to kind of revise the code in simple ways to make it a little bit more pedestrian scaled versus the citywide standards that currently apply. Um, when the CBD code was amended, the sign code was only amended to allow for, to accommodate the number of signs, but every other provision, you have to look back to the rest, like the general standards that are in the code. So there's never been anything that's been specifically crafted for CBD that deals with the types of signage. And so that's what we're trying to accommodate with simple changes. Councilman Maniscalco. Real quick, just for clarification. So would this be to allow signs as, you know, for example, if you're walking down to Franklin Street and a business wants to put a sign, you know, overhead in front of their entrance so you can see that you know, what's coming up, this would pertain to that, correct? It does, and a lot of these things are already allowed in code. So there's nothing prohibiting a projecting sign in CBD currently. It's just that when you go to that specific regulation, you have to go, you have to flip back to general standards, and it's crafted for a more suburban part of town. So um, imagine a strip center along Kennedy or something like that. That building, has frontage maybe on only one side. In a central business district, you have frontage on all four sides. So you have to choose which one's the primary frontage. And it just doesn't work for the types of buildings. And it certainly doesn't work for buildings that are multi-story. So um, the CBD code did address having signs that are allowed only on ground level and on the top of the building. So you can't have signs in between those yeah. levels. But what it didn't do was make those signs that project from the building pedestrian scaled. So the 10 foot, for example, one of the things that we're asking is that the signs, the clearance um, from the ground be only nine feet, which is a pedestrian scaled height versus 10 feet, which would be for a more suburban kind of environment. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing with these changes. So it's basically taking it back to 60 years ago, for example, when there was a lot of neon. Again, I use Franklin Street because it's outside. There's a very famous, uh, not a very famous, but it's on social media. There's a picture of Franklin Street in 1956, and it's just all the neon. But it's signs that you're talking about where, and we want to encourage the pedestrian aspect of it because businesses, offices, restaurants, whatever. So good. We... I I would love to be able to do some something that was even more like what you saw on Franklin Street in 1956. That would be my ideal situation to be able to present to you. We are not touching anything with lighting or anything of that nature. We've tried to keep these proposed changes very minimal, but the design that you're talking about is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Good. I think we did it right a long time ago just like the streetcar but we tore it up we got rid of all the neon neon as an example but we've exactly. made these updates and changed our code over the years to modernize and now we realize we did it right the first time and maybe we should look back thank you very much any other comments or questions thank you councilwoman hertag uh move to file um our file number E2022-8, Chapter 27, Ordinance being presented for first reading consideration and ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, relating to building signs, making revisions to City of Tampa Code of Ordinances, Chapter 27, Zoning and Land Development, amending sections 27-183, General District Development Standards, repealing all ordinances or part of ordinances in conflict therewith, Providing for severability, Second. providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hurtag, seconded by Councilman Goose. Roll call vote. Carlson? Goose? Yes. Hurtag? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Second reader and adoption will be held on October 6, 2022, at 9 30 a.m.
Agenda item number 25, followed number E, 2022-H, chapter 27. Thank you so much, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination, and Council item 25 is the last privately initiated amendment for the day. The applicant is Colin Rice. He is representing Ken Stoltenberg. The request is to amend the bonus provisions in the channel district. Um, so currently in the code under code section 27-140, which is our bonus provision section of the zoning code, the um, bonus um, is actually calculated based upon a formula. So this is when the bonus would apply. This is when you see PD site plans come before you. And sometimes there is a bonus agreement that would um, run along with that um, request. And that bonus amount, um, when it is chosen um, to utilize the bonus as a payment, that amount is determined based upon a formula. That formula contains a ratio. The ratio currently in the code is 10 to one. Um, what is being requested is to modify that ratio to 100 to one. So for every um, $1 of contribution, the bonus provision, um, the developer and the owner, they're granted $100 in equivalent development dollars. So originally the request was um, to amend it for citywide request for any bonus requested anywhere in the city. And then the text amendment was later revised to the um, channel district only. So now that would apply just to the channel district and staff reviewed the request. We have no objections since it was modified to the channel district only. And the applicant is there in chambers um, and um, I'll let them, I'll turn it over to the applicant to present it since it is a private request. Thank you, council. Any questions for Ms. Doc? Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Colin Rice here for the applicant, Ken Stoltenberg, uh, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 2800. Uh, I want to thank LaShawn and, um, and Abby Feely as well for their input on this. Um, it's been very helpful working with them. We're, we're grateful to have their support. And to reiterate, um, we are seeking a very minor change to uh, section 27140 with respect to the bonus provision formula specific to channel district to amend the ratio from 10 to 1 to 100 to 1. Um, what that would mean is for every dollar contribution uh, to an approved uh, amenity for the bonus formula, there'd be an equivalent $100 uh, in equivalent development dollars that goes into the formula. Basically, it reduces what has become an increasing burden, particularly for the channel district, to meet that uh, bonus amount threshold. Um, what, what this really will serve to do is supercharge the walkability and the density in an area where we really need it and is kind of running out of space. And mind you, this is very close to the central business district, which has no bonus limitations. Uh, we think this makes a lot of sense. I think restricting it to the channel district preserves a lot of the other um, bonus amenity viability that could be more appropriate elsewhere. Um, the land values and the cost of construction and all the other inputs to this complicated formula have really created what has amounted to a, a disincentive for for bonus in this region. Um, Mr. Stoltenberg was here this morning. He would love to have the chance to present and speak. Unfortunately, he had a commitment um, that he couldn't move for this afternoon, so he does apologize for that. Um, but that's basically it. I'll, I'll keep it brief. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but we respectfully request your approval today. We had a neighborhood um, information meeting, unanimous approval at Planning Commission, and a workshop before you previously. So thank you for your time today. Any comments or questions for the petitioner? Thank you, Councilman Goods. File number E2022 8 CH27. Orders being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida relating to bonus provisions in the Challenge District, making revisions to the City of Tampa Code of Ordinance, Chapter 27, Zoning and Land Development, amending Section 27 140, bonus provisions, repealing all ordinance or part of ordinance in comfort thereof, providing for celebrability, providing an effective date. Motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in, excuse me, roll call vote. Fierro? Yes. Goods? Yes. Carlson? Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on October 6, 2022, at 9 30 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Council. Councilman Vieira, thank you, Ms. Doc. Councilman Vieira, you have public safety. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I move item 26 to 33. Second. 
Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Councilman Goods, you have Parks and Recreation. Well, I was 34 to 40, Chairman. Motion made by Councilman Goods, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Councilwoman Hertek, you have Public Works. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to move items 41 through 60. Minus 58. Minus 58, pardon. Thank you very much. Second. A motion made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Councilman Miranda, you have finance. Yes, sir. Move item 61 through 70. Second. A motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Councilman Carlson is not here. Councilman Vieira, will yes, you sir? do uh, building and zoning? My pleasure, sir. 71 through 86, I move said items. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Councilman Maniscalco, you have transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move items 87 through 92. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? And if I may set items 93 and 94 for uh, scheduled uh, hearings, October 20th, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. for file number SU1-22-42-C and then DE1-22-235-C for November 3rd, 2022 at 1.30. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded <coughs> by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? I move to open all public hearings. Second. Motion to move all public hearings. Excuse me, by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Woman Hertak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Agenda Ida. Number 95, file number TA CPA 21 27. If I may, oh, oh, I'm sorry. If I may, just really fast for the public, um, at 4 30, I have a call that's probably going to take me about 10 minutes that I have to do. Just FYI, I'll to step out at 4 30 um, for about that time, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, City, uh, members of City Council, Susan Johnson Velez, uh, Legal Department. Uh, this is second reading on an ordinance uh, that would amend the, an ordinance that previously adopted the 10 year water supply plan. If you recall, there was an exhibit that referenced the Pure Project, that, and that exhibit has, was modified prior to um, adoption of the ordinance, but the incorrect exhibit was attached to the ordinance. So this uh, ordinance just corrects that error. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any them. questions for Ms. Johnson Velez? Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak to this agenda item? Close. Second. Sure. Motion closed by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number 95, file number TA slash CPA 21-27. Move an ordinance presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance amending the ordinance number 2022-115, passed and ordained by the City Council of the City of Tampa on July 14, 2022, creating, correcting a Scribner's error by substituting a new Exhibit C for the previous approved Exhibit C to accurately reflect the Exhibit C adopted by City Council, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Second. A motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Goots? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertet? Yes. Carlson? And C. Charles? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank Ray you. Carlson will be an absent. Agenda item number 96, file number E2022 8, chapter 26. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council. McLean Evans, Assistant City Attorney. This is second reading on an ordinance to amend chapter 26 article 7 which is our grease management ordinance to bring it into compliance with state law to prohibit a practice called uh, pump and return grease hauling i'm available if you have any questions as is brad baird uh, deputy administrator for infrastructure he's available remotely by cttv any comments or any questions is there anyone in the public <coughs> who would like to make any comments to this 
Second. A motion made by Councilman Gooch to close, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Yes, sir. Moving to ordinance being presented for second reading adoption. An ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, amending City of Tampa Code of Ordinances, Chapter 26, Utilities, Article 7, Greece Management, repealing all ordinances or part of ordinances uh, in conflict therewith, providing servility, providing an effective date. Second. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hurtet? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. And Citro. Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Citro. I mean, Carson being absent. Thank you very much. If anyone is going to be giving any testimonies, if we have anybody online also, or is going to be giving any evidence or making any comments to the rest of the agenda, please rise to be sworn in. Anyone who has given evidence or going to make any comments. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. File number 97, file, agenda item number 97, file number REZ 22-28. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. This is being presented for second reading and adoption at the location 407 North Manhattan Avenue. Proposed rezoning from RS50 residential single family to PD plan development residential single family attached. Site plans have been turned into the city clerk's office. I'm here for any questions. Any questions for uh, Mr. Hussain? Nope. Seeing none. Petitioner? File number REZ 22-28, agenda item number 97. <coughs> Here for I, I, I guess not. All right, then, is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak to agenda item number 97, file number REZ 22 28? Motion to close. Second. Motion to close from Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You want, me to, you want me to be cheerful? I have an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning the property in the general vicinity of 407 North Manhattan Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification RS50, residential single family, to PD plan development residential single family attached, providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Roll call vote. Hurtet? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously Move with Carlson being absent. Second. We have, mo uh, we have a motion by Councilman uh, Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco to move the resolution. Roll call vote. Miranda? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Hurtet? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carry unanimously with Carlson being absent. Um, <laughs> will you take the gavel, please? Absolutely. Thank you. I love that chipperness. Item number 98. Thank you so much, Zanya Stain, Development Coordination. Agenda item number 98, case AB221 32. This is being presented for second reading and adoption at the location 601 North 19th Street. This is for a special use, term, uh, special use two permit for alcoholic beverage sales, large venue consumption on premises only for beer, wine, and liquor. Side plans have been turned into the city clerk's office. I'm here for any questions. Any questions for Mr. Hussein? No. Nope. All right, do we have a petitioner for item number 98? Anybody register for 98, petitioner-wise? No. Nope. Does anybody in the public wish to speak on item number 98? 98. 
May I have a motion to close? So moved. Motion to close from Council Member Miranda with the second from Council Member Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Council Member Hertak. Would you mind reading item number 90? Absolutely not. Thank you. Uh, file number AB2 21 32. Ordinance being presented for second re reading and adoption. An ordinance approving a special use permit, S2, for alcoholic beverage sales, large venue, consumption on premises only, and making lawful the sale of beverages regardless of alcohol con alcoholic content, beer, wine, and liquor, on that certain lot, plot, or tract of land located at 601 North 19th Street, Tampa, Florida, as more particularly described in Section 3, providing that all ordinances or part of ordinances in conflict are repealed. Repealing Ordinance Number 1989-306, um, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Hertak with a second from Council Member Miranda. Roll call vote. Yes. Yes. Carlson. Hertek? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Citro. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent and Citro <coughs> abstaining. Thank you very much. I had to abstain from that and I will have paperwork forthcoming stating my reasons. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, did you want me to prepare it? Are you going to your office? I believe uh, they're already being prepared. Oh, they are. Okay. And um, the, the law requires that you state just the nature of your, your conflict. Uh, that is an organization in which I'm a member. Thank you, sir. Rough Riders, bully, bully. Uh, agenda item number 99, file number REZ 22 57. 54. Mr. Hussein, 99. Yes. Nine. Res uh, REZ 22-54. Correct. Zane Hussain, Development Coordination. This is being presented for second reading and adoption at the location 1505 East Comanche Avenue and folio number 150327.0050. Proposed rezoning from SHRS Seminole Heights Residential Single Family to SHPD Seminole Heights Plan Development Residential Single Family Attached. Site plans have been turned into the city clerk's office. Yes. I'm here for any questions. Yeah, I, let's do it just in case. Any questions for Mr. Hussain? We do. Seeing none, petitioner. Uh, good afternoon, Clayton Bricklemeyer, Hillward Henderson, 101 East Kennedy. Uh, we've made the requested changes and I'm available for questions. Any questions for Mr. Bricklemeyer? None. Seeing none. Is there anyone in the audience, in chambers, who would like to make any comment? to agenda item number 99. Motion closed. Second. Motion closed by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilman Goods. REZ-22-54, order to be presented for second reading adoption. In ordinance, rezoning property in the general vicinity of 1505 East Comanche Avenue and the following number of 150-327.0050 in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district application SH RS, Seminole Heights Residential Single Family, to SHPD, Seminole Heights Plan Development, Residential Single Family Attack, providing an effective date. Second. <laughs> Motion made by Councilman Goode, seconded by Councilman Matiscaco. Roll call vote. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent. Thank you. Agenda item number 100, file number REZ 22-78. 22 to 74? Yes. 74, yes. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. This being presented for a second reading and adoption at the location 3010 and 3018 North 50th Street and folio number 158155.0005. Proposed rezoning from CG Commercial General and RM16 Residential Multifamily to CG Commercial General. I'm here for any questions if needed. Any questions for Mr. Hussain? <coughs> Seeing none, petitioner. Agenda item number 100. I guess the petitioners don't want to be here. Is there anyone in the public in council chambers that would like to speak to agenda item number 100, file number REZ 22-74? Motion to close. Motion to close by Councilman uh, Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. File number 100, file number uh, 
REZ 22-74, an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of 3010 and 3018 North 50th Street and folding number 158155.0005 in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly scribe in sections one from zoning district classifications, CG, commercial general, and RM16, residential multifamily, to CG, commercial general, providing an effective date. Second. Second. Motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Carlson, Goods, Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson <coughs> being absent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Agenda item number 101, file number VAC 21-13. Mr. Ammons? Ross Ammons, Ross Ammons Development Coordination. Uh, file number VAC 21-13 is being presented for second reading. It's a proposed vacating request to vacate a portion of North 34th Street located south of 3rd Avenue, north of Adamo Drive, east of 34th Street, and west of 35th Street. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Sabbath? Any non-petitioner? Oh, good gosh. It's good. four o'clock. Goodness. It's Must be the epidemic. <laughs> he's, a, he's a 9.30 right. public yeah. hearing. Yes. Well, you know. Uh, okay, is there anyone in council chambers that wishes to speak to agenda item number 101? File number VAC 21-13. Second. Motion closed by Councilman Mascotko, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Vieira. Yes, sir. I move ordinance are being presented for second reading and adoption ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, vacating, closing, discontinuing, abandoning that portion of North 31st Street. 34th Street located at 3rd Avenue north of Adamo Drive, east of 34th Street and west of 35th Street in the plat of second revision of East Bay Park subdivision in the city of Tampa, Hillsborough County. Florida is more particularly described in section two hereof, subject to certain covenants, conditions, and restrictions are more particularly set forth herein, providing for enforcement and penalties of violations, providing for definitions, interpretations, repealing conflicts, providing for severability, providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Good. Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Herta? Yes. Carlson and Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being announced. Thank you very much. Agenda item number 102, file number BAC 22-06. Mr. Salmon. Ross, Ross Ammons, Development Coordination. File number BAC 22-06 is being presented for second reading. It is a proposed vacating request for alleyway located south of Cleveland Street, north of Azil Street, east of Renelli Drive, and west of Trask Street. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Sam? Petitioner. Oh, there you are. <coughs> have you been sworn in? And you are muted? And you are muted? She, she may be having some technical difficulties this evening. Uh, she did reach out to me. Uh, luckily, she did get her video conference on, but she is unavailable to speak at this time. She's the petitioner. Well, mm -hmm. Okay. Is, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to file number VAC 22-06, agenda item number 102? She looks like she wants to be recognized. Could you I ask? am here. Ah, there you are. See, now you're unmuted. <laughs> Can you raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have no major further comments. I have not been advised of any objections to my petition. Neighbors seem enthusiastic, those who've reached out. That's all I have. Thank you. Again, is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to make any comments to this? Do we have anybody online? Move closed. A motion closed by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much, Chairman. I have an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance of the city of Tampa, Florida, vacating, closing, discontinuing, and abandoning that alleyway located south of Cleveland Street, north of Azeal Street, east of Ranelli Drive, and west of Trask Street. 
within the Plata Beach Park Annex, a subdivision in the city of Tampa Hillsborough County, Florida, and is more fully described in Section 2 hereof, subject to certain covenants, conditions, and restrictions, as more particularly set forth herein, providing for enforcement and penalties for violations, providing for definitions, interpretations, and repealing conflicts, providing for severability, providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Vieira? Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hurtet? Yes. Carlson? Good? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Vieira being absent at vote and Carlson being absent. Madam Clerk, did we withdraw 103? Okay, I need a motion to withdraw. Mm -hmm. 103, file number SU122-19C, motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Uh, Let's... Are you sure it's not 105? No, it's Excuse me. 103 is asking to be... It's on the addendum. It's on the addendum. Uh -huh. Thank you for bringing it to our my attention. Who is the motion made by Councilman Who? Good, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is mm, there no. anyone that wishes to speak to this continuance? It's, oh, a, it's a withdrawal. It's being withdrawn. Yes. Yeah. Anyone wishing to speak with the withdrawal? Not necessary. Nope. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? 105. Did 102. 105, 105 is being asked to be removed. Which is file number P8. Ms. Johnson Valles, did you want to say something for the record? No, I just wanted to. She just wanted that. I was reading the file number off. Right. Council. Thank you. Agenda item number 105, file number HPC 22 01 C. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco. Yes, sir. Seconded by yes. Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. File number, agenda item number 104, file number DE122 197C. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good evening. Kamari Pettis Mackel from the City Attorney's Office. Item number 104 is before you regarding a petition for review regarding uh, DE 122197 for the property located at 3003 West Cypress Street. This petition was filed by Andrew Lawrence, an aggrieved party, or aggrieved person, appealing staff's decision that approved the request to waive the design standards in code sections 27282.9, which is uh, regarding single family attached design standards for ground floor entrances to dwelling units and code section 27-241 regarding the West Tampa <coughs> overlay district standards regarding finished floor height. Item number 104 is only regarding a petition for review regarding a design exception <coughs> application. There are other applications pending before the city related to this property. However, this item is the only matter that's properly before city council. The other pending application, applications are not before city council today. As such, city council should not take into consideration other pending applications when you are making your decision regarding this petition for review. Earlier, council was provided a copy of the rules of procedure in order to conduct the meeting along with sample motions and the relevant code sections. For purposes of today's hearing, city council applies a de novo standard of review, which means that your decision is not limited to the record that was created by staff in this case. Instead, you can take public testimony, accept new evidence, and make a decision on whether or not the um, the appeal of staff's decision should be um, to approve the design exception 
in, in regards to uh, DE 122-197. Mr. Andy Mikulski is um, online to provide an overview of staff's decision regarding this design exception application. After considering all the uh, evidence introduced into the record of today's hearing, City Council can take two um, actions. City Council may uphold staff's decision and thereby approve the alternative design exception uh, application in DE 122-197, or City Council may overturn staff's decision and thereby deny the application for the alternative design exception application in DE 122-197. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Mikulski. If I may ask you, please, again, this is just for the design exception. This is not for any type of permitting or variances, except for the design exception. That is correct. This is only regarding the de design exception application. Thank you. I think Mr. Mikulski is online. Yes, I see him now. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Andy Mikulski, Urban Design in, Coordinator. Sir, have you been sworn in? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, Andy Mikulski, Urban Design Coordinator, Development Coordination. May I share my screen? Okay, and what can you guys see? Yes, we can. If you just enlarge it. Okay, and do you see a preview screen or the full? It's full not screen? full yet. Still not there? Still not there. Can everyone on council see the main screen? It says, welcome, City of Tampa. Yes, sir. Can anyone in the audience, can everyone in the Andy, audience see that? Andy, yeah. you have it in yeah. presentation mode. Okay. And how about now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Apologize for that. Again, this is the petition for review of the approved design exception DE 1-22-197. Petitioner is Andrew Lawrence. Property address is 3003 West Cypress. Current zoning is CG, Commercial General, and it is in the West Tampa overlay. The two approved design exceptions are as follows. The first one is to section 27282.9.C, and the request that was granted was to allow 36 ground floor entrances to face interior courts or plazas instead of a street right away. The second item is to section 27241E2C7, and that's to allow garages at the rear of the structures to not be elevated to the 24 inch finished floor requirement above adjacent grade. Here's the subject property outlined in red. It's 2.02 .02 acres. Here's the proposed site plan Here are the standards for review. This is the boilerplate language of 27-60. I won't read all of that right now, but I'll go to the next slide and uh, explain why they were approved. Um, and the important text here is highlighted in bold. That's the, the important text to pay attention to there. So, and now I will walk you through the individual design exceptions, the first one. First one, allow 36 ground floor entrances to face interior courts or plazas. The code section is in italics there. Ground the requirement is ground floor entrances. The front doors to the dwelling unit shall face the street right away, not including alleys, rather than a side or corner lot. Entrances may face interior courts, plazas, or similar design element with the approval of an alternative design by the zoning administrator. So and that was what the uh, the first request was. and. We did grant it. It was, um, we felt it was a reasonable request and it was um, met, the intent of the, met the intent of the comp plan and the West Tampa overlay. And I will go through a little bit more detail here. So this is a similar condition. This is one mile east of the project site. Also in the West Tampa overlay, you could see the, the doors there face an interior, interior side courtyard. This is at Oregon and Lemon. And now the site plan, the green highlighted areas are the courtyards that have the facing that face 
the doors face those interior courtyards. The pink, orangish color there along Cypress is street frontage, and those those units do meet the code and do address the Cypress street frontage. So we did grant it. This was a fault that it, it does not interfere with the rights of others. It is not injurious. It provides a reasonable allowance of use and achieves the general intent of this chapter, being the West Tampa overlay, section 27-241, and the Tampa comprehensive plan. So here's the here's the, from the proposed elevations provided. You could see the, the view from Cypress Street. They do have the, the units facing Cypress. And then the view from New Jersey there, they have the, the courtyards. And we this was going back when um, we first met. I, we've had a lot, of, a lot of back and forth with the applicant on this. And when they first proposed this plan, I, you know, I, I requested that they have doors at least facing New Jersey. So those they did add those doors facing New Jersey there. So you do have the interior courtyard on New Jersey. And then you also have some doors on New Jersey. Design exception two, this is the uh, the second item here that I'll walk you through. It was to allow garages at the rear of structures to not be elevated 24 inches above the adjacent grade. And the language, the code language here, and the intent of requiring an elevated finished floor for residential development is to encourage compatible design with the historic housing styles, which are character, characteristics of the West Tampa community. Um, we granted this one because it is uh, integrated garages are not functional if they are required to be 24 inches above the adjacent grade. And I'll show you my, this graphic here. Um, this should, so here's, here's the proposed design. You can see the front of the elevation, which is the most important part. That's the part that people will engage with coming and going. Um, and as well as the sections along the courtyard, about half that frontage that people will be walking by do meet the 24 inch finished floor elevation. And you can see on the bottom right there, the garages which are integrated into the structure and at the rear, those are at grade and that's to, you know, to allow you to pull into your garage. So we felt this was a reasonable request and didn't have any issues. And this is uh, this is an example, this is a single family house, but it illustrates what, what the design is really gonna do. So you have your 24 inches in front and then the, you could see the garage in the back of this house, the gray house. It's um, not the not the yellow one. That's a separate house. But there's an integrated garage in the rear of this house. And really, to only the only way you could have this set up and to make it work is to taper the grade so you could drive into the garage at the rear. And the site plan again. The overall site plan here. This shows the the green line shows the sections of the building that do meet the 24 inch requirements and the red being the sections that do not um, all the areas that do not are the garage frontages. So we felt there was a minimal request and it again it meets the overall intent of the code and is in the Tampa comprehensive plan and I'm available for questions. Any questions for staff. Thank you. Petitioner? Yes. Now I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Yep. That's okay with everyone? Perfectly fine. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to see you all again. Uh, the last time I was here, my greeting was, hello, gentlemen, and that is now uh, obsolete. Uh, however, the reason I'm here is not obsolete. It's the exact same problem that I was here talking about before. This used to be a 47 townhome monstrosity. Now it's a 42 uh, house monstrosity instead. So, can you give us your name, please? Oh, I, I apologize. My name is Andrew Lawrence. I'm a 3004 West Nassau and the president of the Midtown Tampa Association, which encompasses this uh, property. So, I'm here today for really just for three things. Uh, your time is valuable, so I'm going to speak very quickly. An appeal to sanity. So like this is the, the, the type of thing we're worried about, the easement, the traffic, um, the flooding, that, 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 that deeply concerns us. Um, second, please listen to my expert witness who's going to be following me to talk next. And then please listen to the public comments because we have a number of people here that would like to also render their opinion. Uh, your time is valuable. I'm gonna pass it off now to Amber to speak next. Good evening. Amber Dickerson, um, Urban Planning Innovations, 5312 North Swanee Avenue. 
Um, let me get set up here because I'm kind of late to the game on the presentation. So, can I sit this here without any problems? Okay, so UPI received a request from Mr. Lawrence to perform a planning review of design exception 20, DEI 22197 for 303 West Cypress Street. Um, the development proposal consists of 42 single family attached units situa situated in the West Tampa overlay. So the applicant requested two design exceptions, one for the building orientation and one for the finished floor elevations. The second of which appears to have been properly processed through the request and the approval. However, we found some areas requiring additional attention. The design exception requested um, and granted for the entry doors of buildings H, G, and F facing a courtyard as staff described. Um, and also additionally, there was no request or approval for the proposed roof pitch. Um, these both are essential because basically this block will set the standard for development moving forward. Oops, going the wrong way. Okay, so to kind of dig into the um, interior entrances, the provision states dwelling units should be oriented to the front of the street. The applicant requested and was approved for the Western buildings, which they're not on this graphic, to allow for the side of the building to face New Jersey instead of the front of the building. However, there was no precedent established on adjacent blocks to provide for this alternative. Additionally, there was no justification provided for the doors facing the eastern property line versus an interior court. The green spaces highlighted on the graphic show the entryways face eastern property line and two fences, a strip of landscaping, a sidewalk, um, which does not appear to match the definition of an interior court, plaza, or similar design. And we have a report that will also add to the record with those definitions. Additionally, it appears this specific row of buildings is encroaching into the newly created Tico easement dated August 26, 2022, um, which I will enter a copy into the record also. Mm -hmm. Yo, I'm mixing him up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not enough room up here. Okay. <laughs> Next, let's discuss roof pitch. Um, a design exception was not required or approved for roof pitch. The roof has, this is a very interesting roof. So you see the parapet wall in green and the rooftop in blue. The roof has a slight pitch, about a 2 to 12 pitch. However, it's screened with a parapet wall, which gives it appearance on the exterior as a flat roof. Um, flat roofs with parapet walls allow applicants to exceed the building height by an additional 5 feet, which the applicant is proposing. Um, if this is considered, in reverse, a pitched roof, then the building setback would need to be reevaluated due to the additional height. However, if it's considered a flat roof, the applicant must request a design ex uh, exception and show the established precedent for flat residential roofs on adjacent blocks. Um, this slide shows examples of residential roof lines with the adjacent blocks and they're all pitched roofs. Oops. 
In addition, there are two commercial and office sites to the west of the project, which also have pitched roofs. So in summary, we respectif respectif <laughs> respectfully little, request DEI 22-197 be remanded to the zoning administrator for review of these specific issues detailed. Um, we appreciate your time regarding this uh, matter and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any comments or any questions? Do you, Is that, would you like to submit those as evidence, please? Yes, I will organize them a little first, though, because they got out of order. But yes, I will submit the presentation into the record. Do you have a copy for me? Yes. Uh, Sorry. Well, we have to find out if this, is the, if this concludes the presentation. Sir, did you have any? Oh, yes, I would like to reserve. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. Thank five. five. I'm sorry, what, what did you just say? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I got a rebuttal. I, no, I, my no, apologies. No, just not now. We're okay, to be thank you. Did you, I, is, 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 I'm sorry, you were referred to as an expert. Does your, qualifi your qualifications are, are also going to go into the record or no? Sure, I am an AICP oh, I certified planner. And I, I didn't no know that I have to have the no, certificate. No. Oh, I don't, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just asking that when you introduced yourself, I, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Mr. Mechanic. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Cintro and council members. Uh, I'm David Mechanic, 305 South Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, here on behalf of the developer who is proposing this project. I'm usually on the flip side of these presentations, so this is a little unusual for me. Um, I am uh, going to pass out a notebook which contains no surprises in there. There are, uh, it's just simply a copy of the record of this application with staff comments and public comments. We have also included a uh, uh, two, the resumes of two witnesses, which I will be calling, and I've also included a detailed statement of how the application complies with the criteria that uh, your staff uh, uh, mentioned earlier, the, the criteria that you use to determine whether or not the design exception meets the uh, code requirements. So that detailed statement is in there. I'll be referring to it, but I won't go through every point by point. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jacob Egan, who is the Director of Development for Onyx and East. He is also holds a bachelor's degree in urban planning and uh, will testify as an expert uh, this afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jacob Began, 2002 East 4th Avenue, uh, Tampa, Florida. I'm going to uh, just discuss briefly kind of the process we've gone through to get to the point today. Uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting back in February of 2022 on February 16th. Our first council hearing was on April 28th. We submitted the design exception application on May 16th, and we are here today on September 15th. So we've been working to um, address issues or address uh, public concerns on this application for about a seven month time period now. Um, I am gonna be presenting or pointing to the, to the Elmo screen here. Um, so just high level, some of the changes that have been made uh, from the original application, um, we've eliminated the, we've reduced the units count by five. We did increase the setback from 10 to 25 feet. Um, we did increase the building separation, the increased backup width. Um, maintain the maximum building height, exceed parking, and preserved all the grand oak trees on the site. 
There was a lot of conversation, which I'll get to previous in the previous slides or in the future slides here, um, about preserving the transit corridor that has been identified by the city of Tampa along Cypress Street um, in the in the past. So from, from past conversation. This um, is a rendering of the product. Aaron Barker will be presenting after me, who is the architect on the project. Uh, this is showing that interior courtyard. These buildings will be consistent across the project. So you do see the steps up into the unit, which is the 24 inch finished floor elevation requirement that we are discussing today, um, as well as the application for units facing an interior courtyard versus a public right of way. I do want to reiterate that all of the units do front uh, West Cypress Street. The only condition we are applying for that is the side on New, no, North New Jersey Avenue. Um, that is the rear of a commercial building. That's a loading dock and a dumpster um, across the street and a commercial building that also fronts Cypress and not New Jersey Avenue. Again, here is the elevation. I know there was a comment about the parapet wall in the front. I know Aaron is um, going to be addressing that further. Uh, part of the reason for that, just very high level, is we've tried to stick with the historic West Tampa architectural style, which is predominantly a Mediterranean revival or Spanish architectural style. With that style in other parts of the city of Tampa, you actually are not allowed or, or you're not supposed to be building pitched roof product. Um, so hence the parapet wall facade on the front of this building. Again, here is the side and rear elevations, or sorry, sides and the building section, which you saw in the staff report. Just very briefly, again, I wanted to pinpoint that we are in between Midtown, um, and then we also have the West Tampa Overlay District reaches towards the east, uh, towards downtown Tampa. Um, everybody just says proximity. We're about a 15-minute walk to Midtown, 0.7 miles away. One um, item I did want to point out here is the Midtown project um, is adjacent directly to the west off of Cypress Street. You have the Foundry apartment building, which we're going to look at here in a second, to the east. And then you have Armory Gardens directly to the south and Oakford Park directly to the southwest of the site. In the way of housing, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I just want to show pricing um, and what is going on in the city of Tampa right now in this neighborhood specifically. You can currently, these are updated as of 1130 this morning. Um, there is not a three bedroom unit for rent in this area for under $5,752 a month. The pricing we are talking about on the new home sales, we have estimated just P&I payments in the West Tampa district of $5,186 a month on a new home that costs $850,000. In the Oakford Park neighborhood, you have right down here, $943,000 average sales price, which is a P&I of $5,700 a month. And in the Armory Gardens neighborhood, your average ASP is $862,000. I, I, I need to ask a question. You're showing us all these figures on pricing and, and other things. I thought we were here for just design exception. Yeah, I'm, oh, I want to talk, I'm, yes, and I'm getting to the, and, to the and housing price, portion. I, no, no offense to you, and I'll let you continue, yep. but pricing of a... Uh, May I answer that? The, Please do. The, uh, I thought, again, I thought we were here for design exception only. Yeah, well, the, the comprehensive plan is one of the criteria that you consider in terms of whether or not this design exception is appropriate. The, the comprehensive plan encourages housing types, multiple different types of housing types. So we are simply addressing the supplying of additional housing, which the comprehensive plan is encouraging to be established on a mixed-use corridor again, I'm, and I'm, an I'm urban not, I'm building. Not, I'm not doubting you, but I see different sections here. Uh, but, but, but application criteria for single-family detached standards, uh, West Tampa Overlay District Development Designs, Alternative design exception. It doesn't say anything about pricing or anything like that, but please, uh, go I, ahead. Respectfully, um, section 27-60E5C asks you to consider whether or not the exception achieves the general intent of this chapter, that is the Zodic Code, and the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. So we are addressing how housing is being provided, necessary housing is being provided in this location. Please continue. Thank you. 
And back to just architectural design here, I did provide examples of units. You can see the addresses for the record of the exact same side yards. All of these examples actually, uh, I should say all of them, half of them do not even provide doors leading to the side streets. So it just pinpoints the exact criteria we're discussing today that has been built at the addresses listed below, showing the lack of doors or fronting of the core street. And you saw the same on the um, West End townhomes project built within West Tampa from city staff earlier. And then in regards to the finished floor elevation being 24 inches above grade, this is the Nassau Street directly north of the site. And you can see just a few examples here. This is six homes where none of these homes actually meet that requirement. These are existing on site. And at that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Barker to um, complete the conversation. David Mechanic again, just to introduce Ms. Barker. Ms. Barker has a master's degree in architecture. She has practiced architecture for 35 years at Tampa. Ms. Barker. Thank you. I would say almost good evening, but um, we'll start with good afternoon. I'm Erin Barker. I'm the design director at Sharp Design Studio in Tampa. And I'll be addressing the street frontages of the residents and their raised entry porches and living area relative to the finished grade. So on um, the street frontage of Cyprus, um, uh, there's a little bit of overlap. There are seven residences which do front, uh, six of which which front on Cyprus. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. There are, at the, at the street frontage on Cyprus, six of the seven homes uh, front Cyprus with 24 inch high raised porches and entries. Within the same block of this development, there are nine existing homes on Nassau and Excelda, only two of which have raised porches, uh, consistent with the 24 inches above grade. Along New Jersey, North New Jersey, uh, we've designed a second front facade for the homes. These uh, homes incorporate glass doors and shed roofs um, on the side as well and the elevations along North New Jersey as well as Cyprus uh, consist of the same detailing so they're two fronted buildings is what we would uh, describe them. To the east and the west of the site are commercial buildings along North New Jersey west of the site there is uh, this commercial building which faces our, our side buildings here the other building, which was referenced earlier with a pitched roof, that is the case, but that pitched roof is on McDill. The site that faces this is this flat roof on the back of that building on North New Jersey, which faces our site, as well as our second fronted building. To the east of the site is a vacant property and I, um, the drainage easement, and I believe that there's property owned by Alessi's. There's a small plaza with storefronts and the large Alessi's facility. The design exceptions has no negative external impact on the neighborhood and the proposed residents contribute and enhance to the surrounding neighborhoods. Just a couple quick comments in rebuttal to the earlier presentation. Um, the uh, design exception was for interior courtyards, plazas are similar. A plaza is an open space in a built up area. The, across the street from, Cy uh, from this building on Cyprus is a parapet building. It's a, it's a small office, um, a residential scale. It is a parapet with a flat deck roof on the back. And of course on the adjacent site across um, New Jersey is this building which takes up three quarters of the block facing our community, which is um, flat deck on the back. And um, I think that's it. So I will turn it back over to David. David Mechanic again for the record. In the last few minutes we have, I would just like to try and respond to some of the petitioner's comments. Um, he has uh, talked about traffic and an easement, neither of which are relevant to the design exception. But I would point out that 
at least in response, uh, the easement issue has been worked out. We have no objection regarding the, the easement. Um, Mr. Lawrence apparently in his petition stated that his objection or the basis for his uh, filing the petition for review is because our request is inconsistent with the code sections that we are seeking an exception from. Well, if, if the basis of the objection is that we are inconsistent with the code section, then no one could ever get an approval for a design exception. The code clearly and intentionally contemplates design exceptions when you have unusual circumstances or justifications. I think your staff in its report uh, very ably answered how we addressed all of the criteria uh, in the code and, and that the exceptions were in fact warranted. Um, I would also like to note, and I'm not sure I totally understand the logic here, but the code was amended earlier this year to allow for townhomes to not have to get a design exception if they face a courtyard as opposed to the right-of-way. For some reason, the code section dealing with single-family attached was not amended, but in my mind, those two, a townhome or a single-family attached, you saw what the product was, is, is, is essentially a townhome, and yet the code was changed for townhomes, but not for single-family attached, but we wouldn't even be here asking for the design exception if we were called a townhome under your code. So with that, I'll conclude our initial presentation, and we will probably offer comments on rebuttal as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone within council chambers who would like to comment to this? see one speaker, two. I'm sure Ms. Sanchez is the third. <laughs> if there is anyone else that is going to speak, please form a line my left to your right. Thank you. Please come forward. May I clear off some of the space so that I have... Um... Speaker Waiver Forum with five names. Would you just please acknowledge that you are here and are waiving your three minutes in exchange for one minute? Uh, Marsha Pettit. Um, Marsha had to leave. Marsha had to leave. Okay, I'm crossing that name off. Nick Johnson. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mark Who? I see that. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Emily Cusimano. Thank you. Here. And uh, Adrian Laram, thank you. One, two, three, four minutes additional on top of the three, that's seven minutes. Please proceed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everybody's. I need your name oh, I'm record, sorry. Please. Oh, yes. Debbie Zommerman, 192 Corsica Street, Tampa, Florida, 33606. Following up on the last comments, uh, my whole presentation is changing. I am a registered municipal securities advisor. I'm also registered with the SEC. I'm in my 19th or 20 years as a financial advisor for a housing finance authority for a large county in Florida. I have been in the municipal or housing industry in Florida since 1993. You all probably know Carolyn Wilson. She was my client for over 12 years. I was her, uh, I provided expert testimony in her court cases. I've also provided expert testimony on affordable housing matters in other counties. So I wanted to make sure you understood what I knew about affordable housing. I um, 
work all day every day on this. It's my passion, it's my career, and that's why I'm in front of you. It is changes like this that is creating your affordable housing crisis. You keep changing the codes and building a bigger development envelope. You're creating different configurations, and $850,000 is not affordable for most people in the city. Most people can't afford a $5,000 mortgage. This is being done under an RM24 zoning district. When I did Clipper Cove on the developer side, which is down on Inner Bay and Lois, 176 units on 7.35 acres, that was the first affordable deal down there. And an RM24 is traditionally a two or three story walk up garden apartment with stairs. That RM24 zoning is being basically um, ruined. I'm gonna use ruined, I was gonna use a different word, but I can't say it on the record. It's being ruined by forcing less units with a greater development envelope on a site than would otherwise be there with an RM24 zoning district. So. In many communities, you're going to see, you know, very nice, you know, apartments that were there being torn down. You might have 10 apartments. They say, oh, we'll, we'll tear it down and we'll have less density. Well, you'll have 10 apartments at around 1,000 square foot. You tear them down, and then all of a sudden, you've got four condos that start at 850 or in other parts of the community, a million two, and no one can afford it, and we don't even know if they're living here. So these exceptions are having huge adverse implications on the housing availab availability to people who can't afford something 800 and above. Now that said, uh, staff has done a great job on everything and I think they're swamped. This is just a regurgitation of the PD. They, we made all the same comments in the PD. Their own site plans have, the front is not the garage side, their own site plans, and I took this out of Mr. Mechanic's handout, so I appreciate that he brought this. The front that is facing the eastern side, which is where that storm water sewage area is, and this front, the, the, the property themselves encroach on the easement, and if that's changed, it wasn't in the record yesterday. Um, the rear, which is the garage, is what faces what they're calling a courtyard. It's a paved driveway. It's not a courtyard. Um, and I think definitions that were provided by our professional expert did demonstrate that's not a courtyard. Um, this does conflict with sections 2741, 2782, 11, 27289, 27241, 2760, 27196, or 12296, and 271297. Now, in addressing Mr. Mechanic's comments about, um, well, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to have any exceptions. You have to remember that a design exception one is for minor design changes. In this case, you've got 12 of the 42 homes facing the side yard, which typically is an inactive area. So let's say that this, and this will replicate, our expert said this will create the design standard. What if you live next door to this very, to these 12 units, it's midnight, people are coming out of the house. What is supposed to be a more passive area now has people saying goodbye at midnight on Saturday, dogs running in and out. This is gonna create huge problems down the line in your city. You shouldn't have, someone shouldn't have 12 units facing their side yard. That's, that's not how the code's written. And the code, I've submitted this many, many times, has very specific direction of what shall is mandatory per your code. Shall is all over the overlay district. Shall is all over the different parts of the code that I have referenced. So if shall doesn't mean shall, then you need to tell us why 2741 says shall is mandatory and you can do something that's not mandatory in a mandatory area. And this is where we are hugely frustrated. We go in, we work hard. We've got Ms. Sanchez who worked very hard on this overlay district and in some, she intentionally put in the word shall and she can speak to that. I won't, don't wanna to speak to her on her behalf, but if we work on these words, we get these codes in and then our words are just ignored it's a waste of everybody's time, and the we don't we don't know what the rules are. So, um, there are 29 percent of the units that are facing the side. I think that's not minor. I think the 29 percent that do not face an interior courtyard um, that that is a huge problem. Oh, regarding pedestrian orientation, this is really interesting. Let me make sure I do this the right way. Okay, the the, the person here you might notice it's a football outfit. Um, the pedestrian facade in parts of the code are supposed to have windows, right? 
Well, this is a mock-up of, it's Tom Brady. Look at the football helmet. So if Tom Brady was walking by, that's where he would relate to this window. So is that the intent of the overlay district where they want basically a, a facade that is pedestrian friendly? And then go look at the landscaping plans. Are they gonna really be required to place these two trees there? Or remember all over New Jersey, you're gonna see this, right? And you're gonna also see it on the front of Cypress. I, I don't know if they'll be required to do that. If they don't, you just got a plain wall. Now if we go into the, the roof, the parapet roof, they never put in the plans on the roof. The biggest thing is that, uh, I'll be quick, um, if there's anything on that roof that contributes to height, which roof, the, the, the roof, the pitch roof would, or if there's separations between those townhomes, that has to be included in the height definition. The parapet wall is excluded, but the other stuff isn't. We don't even know what's up there. Um, if the public can't rely on the words in the code, we just don't know where we turn to. I, I mean, we, we show up all the time. Uh, I think this is not staff's issue, staff's overwhelmed, and this is just uh, the PD in another form with none of the issues corrected. And thank you so much for waiting for us till this time, and um, I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and I, may I put my comments in the, my, I've got a handout to put in the record, please. Surely. Okay. I have additional minutes. I don't know if Mr. Shelby wants to go over this. Thank you. And Catherine, I don't want to mispronounce your last name if you can pronounce it correctly. Echeverria, Echeverria. I have to put, put the name. Where is she? She was two up like a second ago. Well, I know she's supposed to be here, but you know, once she's already it's five o'clock. So she okay. left for the day then, is what you're saying? No, <coughs> we're going to the restroom. The restroom? Yeah. Well, let's give her then, the, give, give Mr. Ramirez the four minutes, and if she comes back, we will do the extra minute. Is that okay, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. I'm, did you say my name? I don't know if you did. It's Marla. Did you say Maria? I don't no, I said Norma and Catherine. No, I'm, I'm on. Not I'm not on as well. Marla is there. Is there another speaker after this? I think Sandy. Yes, no, no. Ms. Sanchez. Oh, okay. Marla's on my list. Please proceed. Evening Council, Carlos Ramirez, 2103 West Carmen Street. I live a few blocks south of uh, Cypress in the Northside Park neighborhood, but this is my route uh, to Midtown, to Del Mabry, to go to Target, Home Depot, which we all know is multiple trips each time you want to do something, and to Washer as well. So I, I travel this often. Uh, and I'll make it very quick. 
The concern for me is the release of this permanent easement, and I'll tie it back to the design exceptions uh, at the end here. Uh, here's a site plan. I just added some colored boxes. The purple is the whole easement. The blue box is just the, uh, the section that they want to be released so they can do their buildings. Uh, this did go through the review, and uh, Stormwater did uh, find it consistent with a condition to, um, to um, not build on it until they were able to get all that, or any permits as well. This is uh, Mr. Rodriguez's uh, report here. This is the Stormwater Memo. Uh, and that is very consistent with the current ordinance that's out there today that says no temporary or permanent easement for the utility easement or, uh, sorry, permanent structures and also for the drainage easement as well. Um, I know they mentioned the TECO easement that just uh, was approved. Uh, that also says the same language that they shouldn't build anything um, permanent within the easement. So we all know this area, we've all driven through here, we all know it floods a lot. Um, so that, that is the main concern. And um, the design here shown in red, you can see that that red is that front, front wall, the entryway to the building, and that is encroaching on that easement, which is why they wanna release that section of it. Um, but in, in this picture, it might look familiar to y'all but I just added some squiggly lines. This is the drainage. This is on a normal rain event. This is what happens to that ditch. Uh, and I don't have video, but if you were to watch the video, and I know it's been circulated around, so I'm sure you might have seen it, this water flows pretty fast, and it goes down. Over here is the, um, the site that we're discussing. Here's a lessee's down here, and there's an empty field right there. Cypress is right up here. Uh, that's how much it floods um, when it's a normal rain event, and that is with all that green space. So as this area starts getting more developed, there's gonna be less permeable land, and there's gonna be more water going into these stormwater ditches. So in the future, there's gonna to have to be some kind of improvements. Uh, I also happen to be a professional engineer licensed in Florida, so. The method that we go about when we're doing some kind of drainage improvement is we try to make a wider ditch. Not deep, but wider. Why? Because it makes the water flow a little faster and it gets it out of the way quicker. Um, so this diagram right here shows where the ditch is in, uh, in the easement. You can see that it is way on the east side. Um, so if there were to be any kind of widening or improvements, it would have to be done on the west side, uh, which is where that release of easement is. So the concern here is why, if, if, we approve, if we approve this design exception, then we are going to be stuck with this, with this small quarter to fix any future drainage or any future flooding that might happen. Uh, or if it's denied, then they can go back and do a new site plan that doesn't encroach and doesn't have to be uh, released. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Sanchez has uh, three names. Um, Marla Grant, there you are. Uh, Janice Katz and Larry Katz. Thank you. Uh, three additional minutes, please. Well, gentlemen, there's not much more left for me to say. We've had our professional folks come up here and talk to you. We did not expect the razzle dazzle from the developers, but what else can you expect? Can you hear me? Yes. Your name is Sanchez. Sandy Sanchez, 2705 Fig Street, Armory Gardens Community. As I was saying, we expected to discuss the design exception and nothing else. Obviously, 
the developers came in with their razzle-dazzle as they usually do. And that is the intention of the overlays in the city of Tampa, is to protect us from the bullies, the t developers that just push their way through. The West Tampa overlay was designed to maintain the character of the neighborhoods and to keep our quality of life in place. The creators of the West Tampa overlay worked tirelessly to engage the communities through public outreach sessions to further entwine the community in the long range planning process. It was created with thought, compassion, community involvement, and the expertise of city staff and city staff. The city ordinance was confirmed by these communities, approved by city planners who helped create the, the document, and by you, this city council. We worked diligently to assure the overlay language was mandatory by using the word shall. We attempted to make it easy for everybody to understand. The changes were intended to ensure that the language within the overlay was a requirement, not an option. The word shall means mandatory. Please remember that. The revised ordinance language was approved by the City Council on February 4th, 2021. This change should have locked out any design exception conflicting with section 27-241. As this development was new to comic conflicts with the code, including but not limited to building orientation, roof pitch, minimum floor height, unprecedented parapet walls, and height, the design exception should be denied. The West Chamber overlay is primary above all zoning decisions. It takes priority. There are over 2,000 residences, private residences, who take guidance under this overlay. It is our goal to protect the community and to keep the diversity both ethnically and economically sound. Every time you overturn the West Tampa overlay or any overlay within the city, you are telling the community that you don't care about them and you emphasize that our attempts to keep and protect our communities are not important, that potentially it is just, that is just a big charade. Please have, have to understand we have committed these communities to protect, protect this project. We even hired a land expert to help us and solicited professional engineer to help us with this. We shouldn't have to do this. The West Tampa, the overlays, all the overlays Tampa should speak to themselves. When it comes to the point that a community has got to pay somebody to come in and help protect us, there is something wrong. We have given you clear and substantial evidence that this project should not move forward as currently designed. Please deny this petitioner. Thank you. Is there anyone in council chambers who still wishes to speak to this? Do we have anyone online? Ms. Stephanie Pointer, can you hear us? Ms. Pointer. She's on. Can't see her, can't hear her. Can you see me now? I can see and hear you now. Okay, I have not been sworn. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Stephanie Pointer. I just, uh, I'm sorry, counsel, excuse me. Old habits die hard. Um, there seems to be a new trend in development. It seems that um, this new thing is coming around and I keep seeing it over and over again recently. I don't know if it's an old trend that's come back or what, but um, it's like, let's throw the cake at the wall and see what actually sticks. So we're seeing things come as rezonings or PDs and then they come back as design exceptions or they come back as a SU-1, and it's just enough to make your head pop off. And so, uh, you know, I really, it makes me wonder about um, the authenticity of people who are doing that on a regular basis. And I, I'm seeing it more and more often. We see these projects that just kind of disappear or fade away into that good night. Um, but I'd like to point out a couple things that, that uh, this developer has asked for this, he asked for the rezoning and now here we are with the DE. Please do not take the developer's reduction from 47 to 42 units as a gift 
the neighborhood because in the in the res they were asking for a release of easement that was 6300 square feet so that was all the room for those five extra units that they were asking for this is not a gift i would like to also point out that at eighty dollars um generals cannot afford that most doctors who are not working in hospitals can afford that. You have to make at least $150,000 a year to afford that. We all know that's three times our city council salary. So I, I just need you to understand that there were no gifts given on this. This developer hasn't backed away from anything that they brought to the table to start with, except for their overwhelming expectation that people should give them gifts for building things that are way too out of anybody's price range to realistically live in. Oh, by the way, look at the school zones around there. Are those people gonna move in and become part of the community by sending their kids to the local schools? Mm -hmm. Y'all have a good day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Mechanic. I will also afford you the same amount of time for rebuttal. Thank you. I don't if know. needed. I don't think I'll need it, but thank you. Uh, council members, for the record, David Mechanic. Um, let me address Ms. Pointer's um, comments first, since they're most fresh in my mind. We never once said that we were giving the neighborhood a gift. And it's like they're sort of setting up a straw man to knock him down. We never said that. We never said the units were gonna be 800,000, but that's not really relevant to this application. What, they, they, they're, they're talking about our razzle dazzle, but they're the ones who are raising issues that are not part of the design exception. Ms. Zonerman, talks about, about six different code sections that we're not seeking an exception from. She is saying that she's objecting to trees at the windows or our landscaping in the windows. We're not asking for an exception to the facade requirements, window treatment, or landscaping. So they're attacking things that we're not asking for. Uh, it's, it, it really is puzzling, and this easement keeps on being brought up, which again is not relevant, but I would just like to state for the record that my client has granted Tico an easement which will replace the existing easement. Tico's objection to release of the easement has been withdrawn and it's reflected in the record of the other application that we're not supposed to talk about. I didn't even bring any information with me today because it wasn't relevant to this proceeding. And I would simply ask counsel to confine itself to the points, and I hope your legal department will, will clarify what exactly is relevant to your consideration. And it's those five criteria that Andy uh, so eloquently addressed in his presentation. He said that our re request was reasonable, was not excessive, and met the intent of the West Shore overlay. He's your professional staff, urban design staff, and I believe you should accord him the respect that he deserves in developing this, uh, his, his report. Um, I need to introduce it to the record, the uh, exhibits that Mr. Egan presented earlier. With that, Jackie, do you have anything else? We, we have nothing further, thank you. We ex respectfully request your approval of the staff's letter. Thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of council, just a, a, a reminder, you do have a, um, a copy of the staff report that, are, have, that does have the specific exceptions that are requested. Um, 
and uh, you also have the criteria that's on page two of the staff report and also um, in the packet that was distributed at the start of the, um, of the hearing. And uh, I'd ask that you, when making reference to your decisions, you apply the criteria as it was set forth. If you have any questions about that before the hearing closes. Um, you, I'm sorry. The petitioner still yeah. has the rebuttal. Oh, the petitioner still has the rebuttal. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, I was going with the question first. Petitioner. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Debbie Zommerman, 192 Corsica Street. I would respectfully. No, you may have, oh, you've I can't had, speak. You've had, you've had your okay. time. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I obviously am deferring now to your wisdom and expertise. We have used up a lot of your time today on this issue, and I want to be respectful of that. So that is my entire rebuttal. Thank you all very much for your time today. Oh, please, please, yeah, if you, as long as it's allowed. <laughs> Good evening. Um, so we know staff is busy and things can potentially be missed. We're, we're not stating whether anything, at least from my perspective, is right or wrong. We're just stating that there are certain exceptions that were not requested, like for the roof pitch, um, that's one in particular. So, um, <laughs> so um, the applications, the design exception one, applications for minor design changes. So really we feel that these are above and beyond what constitutes minor. And again, in my presentation, I also pointed out that we disagree about the definition of a courtyard. So that's all, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Yes. What is the pleasure of council? Councilman Maniscalco. So we're here, uh, the, the neighborhood is here asking that we overturn the zoning administrator's approval. So I'm, yes, sir? No, no, I just, uh, <coughs> The, the, the uh, design exceptions and the criteria for the design exceptions upon which you base your decision. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. So I move to overturn staff's approval of design exception application DE1-22-197 for the property located at 3003 West Cypress Street because the petitioner has demonstrated that the application is inconsistent with the applicable City of Tampa Code section set forth herein in 27-60, 27-241E2C.7 and 27-282.9C, and that is uh, found in the staff report for the design exception, the uh, code sections that I've uh, mentioned, and that would be it. Thank you very much. I'll second that. Motion to made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Hurtak. Roll call vote. Miranda. No. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know if anybody wanted to talk about it, but okay. Discussion on the motion? Yeah. Okay, never mind. No, well, not, well, the question is, did you write a call for discussion on the motion? Does, is, there any, is there anybody wanting to discuss? Okay. Roll call vote. Miranda? Yes. Hurtak? Yes. Carlson? Goose? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Information and reports. Councilman Vieira. Uh, yes, sir. I got a couple of names. Um, um, just really quick, I have a couple, and including one is on next week, uh, changing up hey, some hey, things. Hey, excuse me, Councilman Vera. If we could please quietly leave chambers while we're carrying on the rest of our business. 
Thank you. Please proceed. Yes, sir. Um, first, I motion to um, the, the, the Forest Hills uh, Community Center and Park is having certain improvements that are being done. And Shirley, Shirley Reisler worked with the city of Tampa in that park for many, many years, recently retired. And I would motion to have city council request to have a section of those park improvements at the discretion of uh, administration and staff and named after Shirley and that that come back to us um, the, the first week in uh, 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 November. Second. Motion made by Councilman uh, Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. <coughs> Excuse me, is there any opposed? Thank you, sir. And then next, I motion. Um, yesterday, I went to um, a graduation program that included uh, our um, assistant aide here, Connor Darkin, which is a partnership between McDonald's Training Center and uh, Lori Park Zoo, which seeks to take individuals with special needs, some with intellectual disabilities, autism, different types of issues, and give them internship programs to you know, train them, et cetera, get them, get them ready for work, so to speak. Um, I would love to see something like that in the city of Tampa where we have 10 departments, um, each have one intern um, with, with special needs there, hopefully being paid $15 an hour. If you hire 10 individuals, 15 hours a week, $15, that doesn't cost more than 90 or $100,000 for the city of Tampa. Um, and so, I'm not making a, um, I, I guess I can't make any motions on the budget, but um, I am speaking to that in terms of uh, w what I will be bringing up on, I guess it is Tuesday evening for consideration uh, in the budget. Um, so I don't anticipate that uh, uh, costing a lot, et cetera. But Mr. Shelby, am I allowed to uh, make a motion for supporting that for Tuesday in the budget or should I wait for Tuesday? Ma Ms. I, I, unfortunately, I, I stepped out, so I missed the oh, yes, portion sure. well, of what you were discussing, but my suggestion is that if it's outside of something that's on the agenda and it's related to the budget, that you save it for the budget, Okay, then I'll, then I'll save it if I may. Just just that, is the safe, that is the safest way to handle it. Yes, sir. And then third, if I may, next week, I guess we have the um, uh, charter review workshop. I have a um, disability uh, housing workshop item on there. I'm moving to take that off and move that to February of 2023, um, just because we have so many items on there and I want it to get good uh, consideration. Second. A motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now, thank you. Now, I took something off, and I'm asking for five minutes on that day. Yesterday, I met with um, some of our friends that all of us support at Rise Up for Peace, and them and some community partners are looking to do a turkey drive um, that they're looking for community partners to assist and help in. And, I, and I'm asking if they can come on, I guess it's next week, no more than five minutes. Um, to very briefly speak at the beginning of the meeting to make their appeal to the public uh, to be placed on the agenda. Again, um, it would take five minutes, et cetera, if I may. Is, is that charter next week? I'm sorry, what? Charter next week? Yeah. Yeah, and it would just be five minutes. I, I would support that. It's five minutes and not the usual circumstances, but why not? Second. Is it, is it five doing minutes, not five hours? Right. Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to ask questions or anything of them. I mean, five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to use workshop days for that. Does it have to be done next week, sir? I, I want it to be the soonest so they can get the earliest appeal because it's for Thanksgiving. Yeah, and Thanksgiving again, too five minutes. I mean, council's pleasure. I don't mind, but whatever. So you have a motion by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman by Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. And, and then lastly, if I may, and I hope council will indulge me, I have not spoken a great deal today and it's uh, 5.30. I want to speak just for two minutes, if I may, on the um, issue that Mr. Whitmore, I think his name is, the, the nice gentleman in the bow tie brought up about the um, issue of the migrants. Um, I, I want to make a motion, if I may, to have a Tampa City Council letter uh, sent uh, to uh, Tallahassee, the state of Florida, Governor DeSantis on the move by the administration to, it appears with the information that we have, ship about, it appears, 40 or 50 individuals, many of whom are from Venezuela, fleeing a Marxist communist regime in Venezuela, and then ship them over uh, in, in, in what I think is a 
grossly political move to troll, to troll people, to make his base angrier, uh, and, and to move them to uh, Massachusetts, to do a letter opposing that. I, I hear that the governor often talks about the, the armor of God. He always says, puts on the armor of God, put on the armor of God. Well, you know, I was raised in church. I, I probably went to church growing up as a kid three or four times a week. And everything of this move is contrary to, to, to what I uh, learned at church. It really, when I read about it, it really made me angry. Uh, for many, many, many reasons. As you all know, my, my family left Cuba in 1960 as uh, political refugees fleeing uh, Castro, uh, communism, Marxism, etc. And for me, this is not who we are as Florida. We're getting further and further away from a Florida that respects not only human rights and tolerance and decency, but I think our legacy as a state that has many refugees um, fleeing communism and Marxism, etc., from Latin America. As the city of Tampa, we welcome refugees from places like Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. And so this goes against our values. So for me, this is something that is very offensive, very, very offensive. And I think it's good for our city to formally take a stance against that. Second. We have a motion made. Oh, I can do it gladly. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. it to be your office that would send out the letter be from the chair. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. I'll second that. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Y eso es todo. Thank you. You sure? Seguro, mijito. You're sure. I am sure. Okay. Councilman Maniscalco. I have nothing, sir. You nothing. have. You, you have I you're nothing, you're an I uplifting spirit. Councilwoman Hurtak. I have a couple of things. First, uh, at our CRA meeting, we uh, heard from Major DeFelice in uh, Ybor about the parking issue. Uh, and um, the current law as written requires parking lot operators to staff those lots with attendance. This law is not being followed, and the result is that taxpayer resources are being allocated in the form of Tampa police officers being pulled from other locations to respond to crime happening in these unmonitored parking lots. Uh, the status quo is a threat to public safety and is forcing Tampa residents to foot the bill for services that are required by city ordinance to be provided by the private parking lot operators. So I would like to make a motion to have appropriate city staff to review and return with any recommended changes to improve the safety and security of parking lots in Ebor as required under section 27-178 and to specifically review section 27-178 subsection C concerning personnel requirements and explain its enforcement. Second. Um, December 1st looks good. December 1st sounds fabulous. Let's do December 1st. We have a motion from Council Member Hurtak with a second from Chairman Citro. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and on the bottom of all of your paperwork on your desks today was something I dropped off. Initially, a resolution um, for the all for supporting ex a resolution expressing strong support for all for transportation plan on the November 8th 2022 ballot affirming the significant need for investment in transportation to improve the quality of life for all Tampa residents recognizing the tremendous growth in the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County that will increase traffic congestion, affirming the need to reduce congestion, improve roads and bus service, increase transportation options and improve safety that the all for tra transportation plan will address, urging all city of Tampa voters to support the plan, providing for an effective date. Second. Now, now, I'm sorry. I'm um, <laughs> I just want to read the be it uh, resolved so that everyone understands what we're uh, agreeing to. Uh, section one, that the city council of the city of Tampa, Florida strongly supports the all for transportation plan and encourages all voters to cast ballots in favor of the plan on November 8th, 2022. Section two, that all residents of the city of Tampa would benefit from the all for transportation plan and the city of Tampa is prepared to carry out the plan as it is defined on the ballot. And section three, that this resolution t should take effect immediately upon its adoption. And if I can inquire, 
Uh, Councilwoman Hertak. Did Mr. You Shelby, you are recognized. Thank you. <laughs> and just, ju ju just, ju I just want to be clear because uh, I, I had not seen this till this morning, and uh, and uh, I noticed my my name on it. You want this moved today? Is that your is that your request? I do because time is of the essence for is, this. Okay. Um, so. And if I didn't move it today, I would be adding it to the workshop, which we agreed that turkeys was a not was one thing. But, you know, this might be a little bit too far. And my understanding is you reviewed this with the legal department? Yes, I did. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Because I, I, I'm, I'm back to the scene, so I just want to thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a motion from Council Member Hertag, second from Chairman Citro. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Is that all for you? Sorry, I didn't. Is that all for you? Yes, that is all. Councilman Gooch. Yes, I have one. Some of you might have heard my, my good, dear friend, Republican friend, Mr. Eddie Adams Jr. passed away suddenly. Mm -hmm. um, great, great friend. Um, <clears throat> we didn't talk politics. We didn't talk politics. We always talked about the crew that he was so fond of. Uh, he's the captain. I'm the first mate on the ship. Uh, and I, I tell you, when his wife called me that morning, I was just... Uh, in all, but I want to say he was a great actor for his community, for small businesses. Uh, Republican or not, he, he didn't pick sides. He just looked at what the facts were, and he gave you what the facts were, and I can appreciate that with him. So, Mr. Chairman and Council Members, I would like to make a motion to bring accommodation, posthumously, Second. to Mr. Eddie Adams, Jr., off-site at his services Saturday, September 4th. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. I have one, if I may please. Chairman Citro, you are recognized. <laughs> Thank you for being orderly. <coughs> I move to have Stormwater and Legal to appear on December 1st to discuss what can be done about flooding in all areas of Tampa that is caused by drainage ditches that have been filled in illegally and without permits, and what can be done to correct this issue. Council or Chairman Citra, thank you for bringing up Palmetto Street and other places. It's all over the city of Tampa. All over the city. Yes, sir. Councilman, and we have a second from Councilmember Hertak, Councilman Miranda. You, you know, it's funny when I, I just talked to someone in that department just the other day. We passed here, not today or yesterday, but we passed many houses or many pieces of land where they had to have swales on each side and you, you sort of kept it. However, that owner May moved not. five years after and the husband or the wife or whatever says, I want to fill them in so I can plant flowers. Mm -hmm. And they do. They don't know what happened before. It's not in the, in the, when you sell the property, it's not that you can't do that. So there's gotta be a system change. That's, so what that's exactly to what I told the department yesterday. And I'm not gonna tell you who I talked to, but I talked to them at length about all that. And uh, we have a problem. There's other areas that we, we don't check on what's happening. That's why I'm very, I said, you, I trust but verify. This be Barbara Streisand as I call it, but saying we're all related. We might be all related as far as the Bible, but as far as these things to get things uh, done in a proper manner where you only, it's your, your, your family member, I want to see that they really are family members. Because then I pay no tax, and I'm not a tax guy, but the, the tax is being paid by the rest of us because they're not paying it. Well, again, this, this is for a discussion. I understand. Um, and I have received many phone calls from some people in, in West Tampa where because drainage ditches on either side of them have stopped the flow of water and this water is coming up into their property and up to their houses. So I, I just want to have a discussion. And again, I'm not blaming the current property owners where they may be filled in, but what can we do and to rectify the situation? If I may, just the last time, it used to be U-shaped, the ditches, and they made them V-shaped. Once they made them V-shaped, the people, the citizens, who were paying the tax, but cleaning the ditch can no longer we clean it, it because they can't get out once they're in. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Chairman Citro with a second from Council Member Hertag. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Anything else, sir? Receive and file. Second. We have a motion to receive and file. 
by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Then.